Hey, friend. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff I'm really excited to talk about. And it's pretty, it's pretty interesting timing, actually, because just this weekend, I started what I'm internally referring to as the most woo essay I've ever written. Ooh. So it's like auspicious to be talking to you while we're uh, while well, that's going on. So awesome. Yeah. Um, so maybe just to begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your life story at whatever length you'd like answering that however you'd like to? Yeah, totally. Um, so I go by Saddle Sued online. Uh, I think I'm horribly butchering it. I think the real pronunciation is something like Sadal Saud or something like that because it's Arabic. Um, but, you know, online, I just, uh, my real name is Wei. And I'd say that my background is pretty interesting in that uh, both my parents were self-employed. They, my mother was a chef. My father was an electronic composer. Um, they were, you know, talking about their religious beliefs since uh, that's probably where we're going to go. I was raised in a pretty typically like spiritually agnostic, atheist leaning, you know, American culture growing up in Chicago in the 90s. Uh, so I never really got any sort of picture of like, you know, what my parents believed. Like I knew my mom, like I now know my mom was like spiritual, but not religious as you'd call it. Um, and my dad don't really know. Uh, he was not part of my life after about 13 or so. And uh I had a pretty normal childhood, I'd say in, well, no, that's not true. Uh, I like to say that, but the fact is I was like a pretty lonely kid. Uh, and I had like a computer by, I think I had my own computer by 11. And so I just like spent all my time doing uh, computer games, software, not software that came later, but things like that, you know, just working with technology a ton and building sort of this natural intuition for it. Um, over time, I, you know, developed more experience in that, but was also working on art. At one point, I did have a brief uh, dalliance with things like tarot because I was very interested in it, and that was in high school. Um, and I was exploring things like the idea of psionics, which is uh, pretty much like energy work, but sort of viewed through a more sci-fi sort of lens. And I was messing around with this, having a lot of interesting subjective experiences. You know, they tell you, hey, put your hands together in a ball and imagine that there's like an energy ball there and see what happens. And then like you feel stuff. Uh, and then one time I tried it and then I tried to put it somewhere and I told somebody to put their finger in it and they were like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Uh, but ultimately at some point I kind of just decided that I didn't want to be wrong or I didn't want to feel stupid for believing in something that turned out to be nothing because it was like so very little at the time uh, and I kind of just put all that away and became a you know pretty much a firm atheist materialist uh, through most of my like I'd say 18 to uh, mid 20s or so uh, went to school went to an art school uh, dropped out I eventually realized that I like playing Minecraft a lot more. And so I ended up teaching myself Java because I was like, I want to make, you know, Minecraft plugins and I want to make my own games. I want to make something like this for myself. Uh, and it turned into kind of me realizing like, oh, this is where I really want to spend all my time, not, you know, doing homework. Uh, and so that, along with a couple of other factors, ended up with me dropping out of school. And then after that, I had been actually working on my own Minecraft server that I was hosting and running. And I learned how to do development for it. I learned how to do a little bit of front end dev. I learned a little bit of Java. Um, and I realized like, oh, actually these skills could might be able to pay the bills sometime or, you know, get me a job. And I picked up a few contracts and then uh, kind of on a whim moved to Austin, Texas, because I heard it was a good city for tech. And, uh, you know, it had personal transportation or uh, public transportation because I didn't have a car at the time. And I figured out oh, what the hell, I'll just go there. I had no idea, you know, like really just the blooming, blossoming tech hub. And through that progress, uh, through that process, I realized uh, that, you know, I was just working crazy, crazy hard all the time. Um, and I went through a couple more loosening experiences, like signed up for an improv class, but most of it was all this like, you know, grind max, hustle set, whatever, blah, 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 120%. We're going to make a really big thing and, you know, make a billion dollars or whatever through the startup route. And, you know, you kind of roll the dice and hope that you get somewhere good, right? Like that's the dream, or at least having enough money to 
be the CEO or the startup owner or whatever, you know, I was kind of like this very narrow mindset that you kind of get channeled into in that industry where you're like, you're either doing this or whatever you're doing doesn't have value, right? Like you're either chasing the bag or who cares? Like you don't matter in the tech space, uh, the public tech space, I should say. And um, over time, well, I remember specifically what it was the first time where I was Googling around about the idea of what was it? Tumblr witches. Because I saw an article about these, you know, witches on Tumblr, as they called themselves, who were posting basically like these sigils, which were posts made of just like huge emojis. And they're like, this one's for love, this one's for happiness, this one's for, you know, destroying your enemies, whatever, like that kind of stuff. And, you know, there was this interview about people retweeting it and engaging with it and all that kind of stuff. And I had a moment where I was looking at this, you know, kind of with the context of my past history, having like some success with tarot. Like I was actually pretty good at tarot, even as like a 14 year old, uh, I would get these like headaches right here that would occur after only like two or three sessions. But then with time, it would get less and less until I could do more and more and more. And I was like, okay, like there's something happening there, you know, that's related to this process. Um, I did not have the context of the framework to know what exactly that was at the time. And I was like, oh, I'm just tired. Um, so moving forward into the future, reading about these Tumblr witches, I was thinking, you know, there's no way that this many people are into this thing just to mess with me, you know? Like, that's often kind of the way that I would approach things or I would see other people approach it where it's like, oh, like all this woo stuff, all this magic, all this mysticism, it's, you know, you're, you're trying to sell somebody something, you're trying to trick somebody, exploit somebody, get something from them. Uh, but here I was watching a bunch of people like just doing this harmless thing and having fun. And I was thinking also like, either this is real or all of these people, you know, thousands and thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people on Tumblr are getting something out of this that is valuable enough that it's worth engaging with, even if maybe it makes you look stupid or, you know, you have to have a sigil on your Tumblr. And like, you know, obviously Tumblr is a different sort of space, but there's some amount of investment that people are putting into this. And either that means it works and in a way that is not understood uh, by the mainstream, especially mainstream media, or it doesn't work, but it's so valuable and people are getting enough out of it that it's worth doing regardless. And so I thought, well, I want to know what the heck that is, because if it does work, it's if it can give me like, you know, a five, 10 percent edge in optimizing my life, then it is worth spending years of it trying to pursue that. Right. Because it's like blanket is my perception or was my perception at the time. And that was also the way I thought about it. Like, you know, like how can I hone myself, optimize myself, you know, like squeeze this magic out so I can increase a number uh, and. I ended up getting another tarot deck and I started doing some research and uh, reading about pretty much everything I could get my hands on. Uh, the way I learn is very much look at everything that exists, connect it all together and see what it implies about the shape of the world. Because I think a lot of the time we have like one major perspective or belief change. And then we're like, oh, that was wrong. This new thing is right. but through this process, I had that happen so many times where I was like, well, there's no way that one thing can be wrong and one thing can be right, right? Like they all have to have a little bit of the shard of truth within them. And it's my job to basically like triangulate them from all these different perspectives and figure out, okay, what is the thing that everybody does agree is actually happening here? Um, you know, I had some weird experiences. Uh, I started with tarot, just doing daily pulls uh, and finding it, it worked really well, weirdly. And then over time, I eventually was like, okay, I guess I should learn this astrology stuff because tarot had these, uh, you know, all these symbols associated with them. I had this deck called the Hermetic Tarot and it would put all of the planetary glyphs and the astrological glyphs all over it. And so you could learn the correspondences and have deeper meanings. Um, the way I was playing around with tarot at the time was very kind of like still secular spiritual materialist where I was like, yeah, like this is weird and there's weird stuff happening, but I don't really believe it. I'm just, you know, testing it out and seeing how it goes. Uh, and so with astrology, especially astrology, like I had a lot of stigma about astrology, like many people who don't know about it do. And I was like, oh, fucking astrology. Can I swear? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, you know, astrology, like who gives a crap about that? Like that is just bullshit. 
We all know that. Uh, I'll just go read one book and then I'll learn the 10 planets and whatever, and then I'll be able to apply it to the uh, tarot and then I'm good to go. So I bought the one book. It was the only astrology book you'll ever need by Joanna Warfolk. And it is not the only astrology book you'll ever need, not by a long shot, but it was a really good introduction. And I was finding like, it blew me away. Like it just blew me up. I was like, there's no way this book who, you know, doesn't know me should be able to tell me anything that really maps so well to my personality, uh, way above chance, you know, like we're not talking 50, 50, we're talking like, you know, 80% of the stuff I was reading. I was like, Oh yeah, I could totally see that's me. Um, but the other piece of it that was really convincing too, was thinking, well, not just what do I see myself in, but what don't I see myself in? Because out of all the definitions in my book, uh, in my chart that I was comparing the book against, there's, you know, maybe like 90% of the book is everything else. And I was like, yeah, that's not me. That is not my experience. That is not the way I live my life. But I can think of people that are like that. I can think of people I've met who really are those extremes. And so it was kind of this, this uh, exercise in, in reigning in my subjectivity by embracing it in a weird sort of way. Um, and that basically just turned into a, a massive, massive, ra massive rabbit hole. Uh, I realized, oh, hey, I could probably combine uh, computation and astrology. And I started a project where I was first interested in thinking, well, okay, if this works, then uh, uh, I'm a single guy. So I should be able to use it to find a partner, get laid, something like that, right? Because uh, initially astrology is like, okay, it's all about personality. It's all about who you are. And thus it's also about compatibility or uh, synastry is what it's called. And uh, in, astro in the astrology world. And so I was learning a lot about synastry because I was thinking, well, I could save a lot of time uh, going on all these dates and, you know, like exploring these, you know, long paths of people. If I could just look at our charts and be like, okay, yeah, like that's promising or that's not. Maybe I don't know everything, but, you know, it's, it's a filtering criteria. Um, and then I thought, well, actually that could be a dating app. You know, I'm like, okay, let me put on my capitalist hat here and think you could make a dating app where you could use astrology to build a long standing uh, database of people where every time somebody new joins, you just compare their uh, chart against every other thing uh, in the database, every single person. So, you know, even though you're not actively using it, it could still uh, deliver value. And you could even tune the parameters of your experience because that's what astrology lets you do. It lets you choose these sorts of experiences. Um, Eventually, or rather immediately, I realized that that to do it in a responsible way where I felt that it actually worked and it delivered the value I wanted to, that I was seeing in the first little hints of synastry I was doing for myself, I realized I would have to do this for, you know, like, hundreds of interviews with couples. I need to look at their synastry. I need to gather it. I need to, you know, mark all the data down. I need to convert it into an algorithm. I need to figure out how to interpret it. I'd have to like compare notes, all that stuff. So I gave it up. Um, but I had the core software that let me pull charts, that let me run them, that let me do basic calculations, transits, things like that. Um, over time, seeing more and more examples and using astrology more and more in my own life and the way that it pops up, time and time again. Uh, at this point, I've pretty much been completely astro-pilled because I'm just using it and working with it constantly and it delivers pragmatic results, which is mostly what I search for. But now it's taken on a much more sort of insold and uh, spirit-focused emphasis, which not everybody is down for. And I kind of pull that back a little bit when I'm talking to people who are not uh, either familiar with astrology or come from a more like atheistic, materialistic worldview. Um, but there's a whole lot of evidence that that is not what the world is like, and that is not what reality is like, and that we don't have to live that way, and that a lot of what we could have does not necessarily have to take away from the culture that we live in now. And so, you know, there's this whole idea of like a slippery slope of like, oh, what if you believe in this stuff, and then you go insane, and you know, you become really stupid or whatever. Um, I don't know, it hasn't really happened to me as far as I can tell. You know, certainly people who would presume that has happened say it's happened, but... I still feel like myself and all that. But um, where I am now as a result of my perspective is kind of interesting because, you know, I come from this dual background of getting to play around with this spirituality, astro astrological, new agey, woo sort of stuff, but also having a grounding in like, okay, how do we actually computerize this, turn it into software, think about it analytically and carefully and very precisely. Um, there's as many ways to do as astrology as there are people. And this is my methodology. Uh, and I do think it is a unique strength for me because I can kind of see both camps. 
it has some difficulties because, you know, some people out of both camps are like, I'm the enemy because on the one hand, I'm, you know, trying to bring in this idea of like woo and spirituality, which is obviously fake. And then on the other hand, I'm trying to add computers and uh, analysis and things like that to the woo, which is obviously impossible. I disagree, obviously, with both camps, uh, with plenty of nuance that respects a lot of viewpoints, because I think that's the only way that we can get to a world where we're able to use this and not, you know, have a have a real sort of like contention about it, because I do believe that we can bring our lives into alignment with these very, uh, in some cases, very easy and simple tools, if you automate them, that don't necessarily have to have you, you know, ending up making your own altar and praying every day or meditating or what have you. Like, I think there's lots of low hanging fruit for the people that, you know, could just use an app for it or something like that. Um, but then on the flip side, for people who are really interested in the wisdom and in learning, it's genuinely life changing. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of where I sit. I'm, I'm personally invested in trying to introduce people to astrology who are interested in it, who are trying to find something a little bit deeper about the world and about their own experience. Uh, it's only one map of re reality, but it can be used very, very effectively in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. Just out of curiosity, oh, and uh, you're lagging a little bit for me, Tashin, I think. Okay, is this better now? Let's see. Okay. Um, so just out of curiosity, um, when you were in school, what you said, I think you said it was art school, what were you studying at the time? Yeah, so I was initially studying drawing and then went into film and video art once I realized I liked that a lot more. Um, I've always been interested in film sort of tangentially. I've done a little bit of improv, things like that. So there's an interesting kind of like showboaty uh, performance aspect too that kind of comes across. And like, you know, I've used astrology to do shows and whatnot. Um, I initially, yeah, started in drawing because that was kind of just what I defaulted into. Uh, but then the moment my mom got me like a little point and shoot camera that also happened to have like 480p video, I was hooked and it was over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's your, similarly, what's your history with um, like development and tech? Like once you were kind of like in the tech scene, what what's that aspect of your career and life been like? Yeah, uh, so I've been working in tech for about a decade at this point, four, three or four years as a software engineering manager, uh, and then six or so on the back end doing IC or individual contributor work. So I started as a front end developer, so building like UIs that you can actually see and interact with on devices, uh, and then mostly got into leadership work and management after that and kind of stretched out into full stack, so building entire applications. So over that time, that's kind of what's given me the, you know, pulled together bits and pieces where I'm like, okay, I could actually build an app on my own, like, from the bottom up, because I've seen a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just, um, I've been aware of this before, but just in the context of this conversation, really coming home, like how, how much of a um, breadth of like skills and backgrounds you've been exposed to that like, I think really brings that unique flavor to the way that you approach these things. So I was just curious to hear more about that. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to ask as well, like, could you dive into some of the things that you started to see from your tarot practice and astrology and other things that you were exposed to, like, as you applied those things to your own life? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the first practice for me was definitely the daily tarot draw. So I would basically every morning just draw a single tarot card and look at it and contemplate it. And, you know, there's a set of default meanings there and you can uh, read those and then just think about it throughout your life as, as you go through your day and see what you observe. And, you know, at first, like the natural thing to think is like, oh, well, you're just looking for the stuff that you saw in the card. Like the card is random. It doesn't matter. Um, but over time, you would see that these would line up with events that were outside myself and that would happen to me as opposed to coming from me. Uh, a lot of the time it was something more abstract, like, you know, the two of cups would be friendship and I'd, I'd end up, you know, randomly hanging with a friend or meeting somebody new or having a sort of flirty conversation or something like that. Uh, other times it would be like painfully literal and concrete. Like one morning I, I got the hanged man and I didn't understand what it was because it's just like being 
kind of being stuck there, not doing anything in particular, et cetera, et cetera. But this was also the time when I was just starting to go bouldering and I went bouldering that day, came home, came to my journal, looked at the hangman and was like, oh, <laughs> like mm. literally hanging. And, you know, sometimes it's kind of dumb like that. Sometimes there's not really anything else going on. It was a pretty boring day, you know? And I was like, <laughs> okay, got the point. Like it can be very literal in that way. Um, and, you know, that's just one example, but you'll have those happen over and over and over, you know, like uh, the relationship with uh, my spouse, uh, Raz now was really hinged around the fact that we drew the, not hinged, but was signified by these two tarot cards we drew, again, the two of cups and the ace of cups, which are all about feelings and emotionality. And that was actually the thing that made us be like, okay, we have to talk about this. Like we have mm. to talk about what's between us because there's definitely something between us. Mm. Um, and then, you know, that turned into a marriage. So that was pretty useful. Um, in terms of uh, the astrology, you know, it started, I mean, just right away, it was the fact that it could say anything at all about me because there's a tendency, a fear tendency to be like, well, that can't possibly be true because it's, I'm just con confirming myself, blah, blah, whatever. But you know, it's not really a 50, 50, is it? It's like a one out of a hundred hit out of all the possible configurations and things that you could say about what a person is. And to do that, you know, like seven out of 10 times is just like insane. Like, it shouldn't work at all. Mm -hmm. And I just had to be really honest with myself about it and say, hey, like if this works at all, I have to pay attention to it. And if it keeps working, then I have to keep paying attention to it and see how deep this goes. Because if this works at all, then I am completely wrong, 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so through astrology, it's like many, many different ways. You know, like the first examples I would see uh, would be, I was talking to my two friends who were skeptics, they were both married. Uh, and I was reading one of uh, my, one of their placements. And I said, oh, you have a Virgo moon. It means this and that and that. Typically like very analytical way of thinking, prone to anxiety, uh, those sorts of things. And then uh, she was like, well, yeah, that does sound like me. Uh, and then her husband was like, yeah, that sounds like me as well. And then I looked at her husband's chart, Virgo moon, both mm. of them. And so they had the sinistry right there. You know, I was like, oh, well, okay. Um, at the time, I wasn't really good enough to explain why else that was important and like what other factors there were. But like for me, I was like, okay, that's another strand to pull on. That's another note to take for myself. Uh, some sort of correlation that shouldn't happen. So basically like, tons of stuff like that. Eventually I got into transits, which also show you predictions. And then just stuff would happen in my life where I was like, yeah, that's the definition of that transit. You know, mm -hmm. like that is what I read and then it happened to me. So I'm like, well, okay, I guess that, you know, it's not like I could have caused this thing to occur to me, but it did happen. So one. I, um, you've been really uh, writing up a storm recently, writing some really lovely stuff. And uh, I wanted to pull out a specific sentence that you wrote in the phenomenology essay. Around here, we take our phenomenology seriously, which is both an, an excellent tweet and an excellent essay. <laughs> um, yeah, I just felt like that said something that I already, I already, I, I already agreed with what you said in there, but it just said it so well and might help someone that might not see things that way already tremendously, but I wanted to pull out a specific sentence from that essay and read it to you and ask you about it. So if you're reading this, you probably know who I am, but if not, I'm a formerly atheist programmer, skeptic turned woo woo tarot card throwing astrologer programmer bowed down by the relentless phenomenology of my experience. I did not particularly enjoy the experience of having my worldview chipped at piece by piece every morning by an uncannily inexplicably accurate tarot card but my life is infinitely better for it now. Wanted to ask you about um, this description of having your worldview chipped at piece by piece. And I know it's really e knowing you, like we've talked before and met before and, and talking to you now, it's like very easy to like rewind like seven, I don't know how many years ago and be like, oh yeah, he was probably like pretty skeptical, like in his head, like, like programming to get money kind of thing, the way you're describing, like that's easy to imagine. And then, you know, you're like doing your thing now. And I wonder what that experience was like for you. And, and almost, almost like, what would you tell your past self about like starting this journey of like, Hey, you're going to get into some weird shit. Like, here's what you should know. What would you tell that person, either yourself in the past or someone who might be in a similar position right now? Yeah. To tell myself, 
it would be something like, it's okay. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to get really weird, but it's 100% worth it. Because my experience at the time was, uh, you know, I described it as really being dragged, kicking and screaming. And, you know, I didn't enjoy the experience of going through and being, talking to my friends and being like, hey, so I'm trying this thing. Can I do it on you? <laughs> and then, you know, most of my friends being skeptics because those were, the, that was the friend group that I had cultivated and created. Um, if it were somebody that isn't me, I would say, pay very close attention and don't come to any conclusions. That's it, because that's all you really need. Um, one time I made a tweet and it was about astrology. It was about woo stuff in general, about you know how enriching it can be. And somebody sent me a message or uh, they left a reply that was like, you know, I really wanna start, but I'm not ready to take the leap of faith. And I told them, you know, there's no leap of faith required whatsoever. All you gotta do is, you know, buy a tarot deck or even an app or, you know, just do some astrology online and just take a look. You can always back away uh, from the pit at any point. And really it's not a pit, it's a jungle. You know, the deeper in you go, the harder it is to come out, but you can take that first step in and just be like, nah, there's panthers and cougars and snakes and bugs and it's really sweaty and muggy in there. I don't wanna go in there. Um, not necessarily a description of woo, but you know, that's how it can feel uh, from the outside. Although sometimes it gets that way on the inside too, yeah. Uh-huh. Let's see, how do you, I don't know, I saw this tweet earlier today from you where you're like, I, this was this was like so quintessential you, I loved it so much. You're like posting about this pyramid that you're putting over your food yeah. because some people report apparently that, uh, that that preserves the food better. And then you're doing next to it some other food that's the same food, but not preserved. And you're, do, you're running the experiment for us. Um, yeah. Like, so this is like novel territory for you. Uh, mm -hmm. In this in this domain, how do you how do you think about that or approach that? Like, what? How do you evaluate what you're finding when you do pay attention to your experience when you do run these experiments? I mean, that one's pretty straightforward. Of like, obviously, if the food is better preserved, that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But you know, say you're encountering something that's like a little bit less tractable or, or um, like obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Even with the, the food example, you know, I've got 10 grapes here, 10 grapes there. Uh, there. There's a lot of variables to consider, such as, you know, is me passing by it having some sort of effect, especially the fact that I'm seeing it. So somebody commented on that because, you know, around my space, we believe that intention affects stuff. So even if there is an effect of the pyramid, we still ideally would cancel out the awareness of the experiment. We do it double blind uh, and would not, you know, have it visible because now it's like in my kitchen, I walk by it and I glance at it and I'm like, uh oh, I hope I'm not, you know, sending bad vibes to the, to the outside grapes or good vibes, <laughs> the inside one or whatever. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, I'll move it in the back. But like the way that I think about that, even if that do is, does seem to be the case is, taking what you know about metaphysical concepts or your experience of spirituality and applying it with a little bit of, you know, fuzziness or a little bit of bleed, right? Like depending on how exaggerated the effect is, if the, if the grapes are barely any different, then I'd be like, okay, maybe that was my brain. Uh, or maybe it was slightly the pyramid, who knows? But if it's very dramatic, I can be like, yep, that's probably the pyramid. I don't need to think about that too much more in practice, right? Uh, but for this, this is an experiment for my own gratification. So I'm probably not gonna go out and do the double blind thing. I'm probably not gonna you know, compile a ton of ex like pyramid fruit experiments or anything like that. I can just say, hey, I did this, it seemed to work. You can try it if you're curious, out and, uh, curious enough and then go for it. And for me, I'm just like, okay, I have this little fuzzy nugget of a little bit about reality, which may or may not apply somewhere in the future. And if it does become critical, that's when I decide to go out and like research a lot more about it. So like if I were to say, oh, all of a sudden I think I want to build a giant pyramid because of this experiment, <laughs> I might I might then, you know, go, go read some books on pyramids or something like that. Um, but for the things that are more subtle, I would call it the general suspicion of, uh, suspension of judgment and disbelief. And 
you know, normally that's like a bad thing, right? It's to enjoy fantasy. But when we're dealing with the reality that is very subtle, very nuanced, very layered, that can have multiple impacts where the observer is a participant in the experiment and affects the outcome of all experiments. And even thinking about the experiment or controlling or conducting the experiment can change it. You have to be really, really thoughtful, I would say. You have to really be careful where you draw hard lines and where you don't. Because sometimes you do need a certain hard line, right? Where you're like, no, that is a reach based on what I know and have seen to be true. And I'm just grasping at straws. So a lot of it is about the interiority of your experience. Because one thing that I've learned as I've gone on and done this work is that it's very intuition building. And you often have an intuition about when you're correct about something or not. And even that it can be suspect, right? Because we're talking about uh, paying attention to an in, a subjective inner state, which you know you may misremember, which you may uh, be caught in the throes of. It can be very difficult to manage all that. So all you can really do is to say, I'm not going to decide what this means yet. I'm going to do it multiple times over and over and over until I think I have a working theory. And then if I notice something that seems to break that theory, then I got to you know, look at that really, really hard and think about that really hard and try and replicate it in, in whatever manner is possible. I, I think that gets to a really good point, which is um, for me, at least in my own life and practice and experience like that, that seems like really the crux of a lot of this territory for me is like noticing and noticing that thoughts and feelings seem to have causal impacts, which is, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, in direct contrast to like the ordinary phenomenology that a lot of people you might bump into in a shopping mall are inhabiting, right? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, like theoretically, maybe quantum physics says something about like with particles here, the observer effect or something, but like in everyday life, your thoughts aren't people, you know, like the, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I don't think that the everyday phenomenology that people are inhabiting is something that is ever like formally indoctrinated in the way that you like might learn, I don't know, um, the Pythagorean theorem or something like mm -hmm. that. It's not like anyone is ever like, well, time is linear and your thoughts do not have causal impacts. And like, uh, you know, everything is matter, but somehow that's just baked into the ordinary experience of mm -hmm. going to a Starbucks or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and and then for myself, just again and again, from lots of different angles, noticing, oh, no, 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 like thoughts do seem to have causal impacts in a variety of ways. And then that that axiom shifting seemed to open up a lot of things for me of like, oh, a lot of these things seem more plausible or a lot of experiments are possible or mm -hmm. um, different techniques start to make more sense. Uh, does that does that track with your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's actually... I say this a lot, but it's, it's a very complicated subject as well, because the amount that you pay attention to your phenomenology and especially anything that has to do with symbology or signs tends to turn up the volume of all of that, both in the uh, quality and significance of the thing itself, which you could say, okay, like, yeah, that's just my brain, uh, you know, honing in on it, but also the quantity. So mm -hmm. not only do you begin to notice more singular events, you notice more of them happening constantly until the fat, until you're just like getting hit in the face with freaking omens. And you're just like, enough, stop, I get it. It's real, I understand, I understand. You know, like I've literally had like those uncle moments where I'm like, you need to stop. This is too much, I'm freaking out. Like, uh, and it's, you know, it's a very bizarre experience that way. But then on the flip side, the thing that makes it so hard to, I think, access this modality is the fact that it is presumed. You know, you will find in certain instances that like, okay, somebody will directly explain what magical thinking is and why it's bad and why it's wrong and all that stuff or how, you know, uh, whatever fantastical seeming thing is just uh, Neil, De Neil deGrasse Tyson, whatever, explain away, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he loves to do that. He loves to take something normal and pretty cool and then be like, it doesn't matter because it's just this physical happening, you know? Um, but people will do that with magical stuff all the time. They'll NDT it. Uh, and so when I think about that, I think, you know, we're living in this society where that's constantly reiterated over and over to the point that it's not just a concept, you know, like you could say, hey, let's talk about a theoretical 
alternate view of physics, right? Let's talk about this thing where we have our terms defined. Let's try and have a conversation where we call evil good and we call good evil just for the hell of it. And people will be like, that's weird, but sure, you know, I'm down with that. But if you say, hey, let's question what is essentially a cultural and social stigma, people flip out because mm -hmm. they don't want to be seen associating with you because they know what that'll do to their public image, to how they're perceived, and also their own ego and their own perception of how they think and how they perceive the world. And, you know, missing a really, really, really big thing is part of it too. Uh, but that's not anybody's fault, right? That's just kind of how our culture is structured. And that's the the natural lines that we fall into. But, you know, that's just the mainstream. Like there's plenty of people having these kind of outside experiences on the margins where they're able to see this. Hmm. Uh, would you say there are any other really critical axioms of the worldview that you've come to inhabit other than like this one we were just talking about of like thoughts and feelings have causal impacts, like any other like key load bearing pieces of your worldview? Yeah, I got to pull them up because um, they're deep in there now. Hmm. One of them is that there is the right time for everything, which is, you know, uh, it sounds very vague, but I mean it in a very literal sort of way in that my conception of astrology is that it mirrors the way that things are. You know, the uh, planets are not literally sending rays. I mean, who knows, science might find out something crazy, like they're finding crazy stuff every day about the nature of reality. But like, so far the mainstream perception in astrology, like people who actually practice it, is that uh, the planets are a system of signs. So when you're looking at, for instance, you know, I can say the sun is in cancer. So uh, it's more likely for people to be caring about reproduction rights. That's cancer. That's motherhood. That's nurturing uh, about, you know, families, babies, uh, even, you know, the breasts, like the cancer rules the breasts as body parts. All of the signs rule different body parts. Um, and we might say, you know, Mercury there also suggests the communication because Mercury is also in cancer. But Venus is in Gemini and Gemini is very prankstery, uh, very playful. You know, you like to like to do a lot of gossiping around that time. Uh, I feel like gossip is really picked up going during through the, the Gemini periods just on Twitter. Um, so you would say, OK, well, this is a great time for gossiping about, you know, uh, women's rights or I mean, I want to say gossiping about that, right, like discussing it, but then just gossiping about people in general situations, uh, contemplating what it means to make a home or to have a family or to give birth or to care for somebody in a really genuine way. Um, and that happens on the slower time scale. You know, you have Jupiter, Saturn out there also signifying things. So like Jupiter is in Aries, uh, bringing, you know, lots of aggression, lots of independent thinking, lots of sort of like martial attitudes to the fore. Uh, you know, I could delineate the whole chart this way. But basically what I'm saying is that this is a general period of time during which people will probably be more broadly affected to go towards this direction. But everybody also has their own natal charts. So the sky its impact will be based on how directly it contacts the places uh, that signified the story of your life at the time of your birth. So when I say that every time there is a time for everything, I mean it in a very literal way. Like there's a very specific time at which you should do something that will have an ideal or an optimum effect, both going by the signs, because it suggests a receptivity on the part of the universe according to the signs of astrology, uh, or call it, you know, reality or the, you know, uh, unconscious consciousness or public, you know, connect collective consciousness, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this would be a good time for that sort of stuff. Like, for example, I, I just out of nowhere ended up watching Russian Doll, which is entirely about, well, season two is about family history. I don't want to spoil it any more than that, but it's a very, very cancer show. And even though it didn't come out during a cancer season, I started watching it during a cancer season. I was like, oh, hey, this is totally on theme for the thing. Um, so that's that's one layer at a very broad layer. You know, that's kind of like societal. That's where you see things. Uh, I, I believe that when we have these major sorts of configurations, you, think, you see things happen in the public sphere. You know, you see things occur very broadly. Like for instance, when we had all those things uh, with the, the buildings slowly collapsing into the water, into the ocean, that was a Saturn-Neptune sextile or semi-sextile where those two planets were directly in alignment with Saturn being uh, 
uh, structures, old things, but also like the literal ground and Neptune being oceans, waters, dissolutions, you know, things disappearing. And there was also that uh, really big restaurant uh, boat in China, which was like super, super old that finally got towed away very slowly, you know? Um, so like that's an example of one of the public uh, surface significations. But the moon moves through the entire sky uh, in 28 days or so and goes through every single sign. So you have the distribution of all these things occurring. And then the ascendant moves one degree every four minutes. And so the ascendant is like literally the horizon. So as the earth turns, you have a different sign on the horizon suggesting a different sort of nature of things to happen. And then there's another layer called lots, which are these special points that are derived from a combination of planets and the ascendant. And those can move even faster, sometimes slower, but usually faster because you have the dual movement of the moon and the ascendant as the root for most of them. And so you have like all these different things that are signifying different moments where special things could happen uh, or where there are certain things that are ideally supposed to come of that moment. A lot of the time this happens completely accidentally, right? Because it's kind of like the mind of the universe. Like people get uh, possessed with the idea that, oh, I should do this thing right now. Or, I, you know, like this is the time I want to release this thing. Then you look at the chart and it perfectly describes the thing they wanted to release. Mm -hmm. uh, other times when people get a very impetuous impulse where they're like, oh, I like need to do this, but it comes from a place that is uh, not of wisdom, I should say. Like it is a pressure, it is internal kind of like driving conflict to do something. You can often see that in the chart too, suggesting people taking hurried actions or not thinking very well through the course of their actions or just, you know, doing something prematurely or it just having bad outcomes overall for that type of action at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's one which is important. So I talked about it a lot. Mm. Can you say more? I'm not sure I understood about um the way you were understanding the causation of astrology of like, there are all these planets and, and, and you're, you're, you're saying that they are signs rather than directly affecting us. Is that right? What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And can you say more about that? Yeah. So there's many different conceptions of ways you can think of astrology. One is one being that the planets directly cause stuff to happen, uh, which is a very old, you know, view from thousands of years ago. And mainstream science says, no, that's not possible. Like, you know, nothing can travel through space like that. Like nothing would affect us, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I recently learned that it only takes a couple minutes for light to get to us from Pluto. And there's a whole spiritual principle around light. So I put a pin in that and I'm suspending my disbelief about it. Uh, but that is not the model that I usually explain to people. I just think it's very interesting and, and is one example of a way you can think of it. The other way, is more that information is encoded into reality everywhere. And so there's a whole kind of like metaphysical Gnostic idea of emanations behind this, which is that, you know, there's one original thought of the, 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 the one, the source, the God, whatever you want to call it. And then that thought is actually what formed all of reality and that we're at the lowest layer, the material layer, where all of it evolves most slowly, but because it was a thought, it's information and that thought, uh, the most efficient way to create something is to use very abstract information structures like numbers, arithmetic, physics, et cetera. And, uh, you know, things like the golden mean, how you see fractals all over the place, uh, DMT trip, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Essentially saying that information is encoded into the very fabric of reality everywhere you look. You know, you could look at a chart at any moment and find out something that's relevant to what's happening in your life at that moment or what you're thinking about. Um, you know, you could hear a bird, you could learn to interpret omens, you could do tarot, you can do all these different sorts of things. So along that idea, when we're talking about planets, we're really saying that they are signifying the topics that the ancients have over many, many years known and observed these to correlate to. So, you know, Venus, Venus is, rules Taurus and Taurus rules cows and cattle and uh, livestock in general. So based on the quality of Venus, we might say, oh, because 
well, we say because as a shorthand, but as we see Venus here, we may also see these cows go through some sort of experience for better or for worse, depending, you know, like that is the way that a farmer would use astrology way back when. And that was super, super important for all of these cultures, planting by the stars, planting by waxing moons uh, and harvesting during waxing moons, because that's kind of like the sign of things coming up into existence. You know, waning moons take things away, symbolically speaking. Hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Are there any other like key axioms or things that form the way you see things? There are, it's just like such layered, <laughs> you know, learnings as I go. The other thing is that, yes, yeah. Um, it goes back to the idea of thoughts affecting reality and that you know, phenomenology and subjectivity, which is that not only is, not only do thoughts affect reality and not only, you know, does telepathy and stuff like that exist just on like a very basic level. Like, you know, we, we like to pretend that it doesn't, but it happens all the time when we're like, oh, I just thought of you. And then you texted me or called me like, that's telepathy. What, what else do you want to call it? Like you can pretend it's not weird, but it's fucking weird. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, so not just that level, but also that your beliefs cause reality to deliver the results of your belief to you. So if you believe that the world exists in a certain way and you truly believe that, then it will constantly reaffirm that to you, mm -hmm. which is why people who are in very different camps of reality can never really have a conversation unless they're willing to play suspension of disbelief games and say, okay, well, what about your reality? But most people don't care about other people's realities. You know, They don't have a reason to care about other people's realities. You're just going through your day, you're doing your things, you have all your own concerns, you have your entire conception of the world and the universe or reality or the dream, if you wanna call it that, You know, some people describe it that way, is just conspiring to co-create what you believe. Hmm. To some extent, you know, like I do believe, like for me, I did not believe in this stuff at all. And then I got yanked onto it. So there's an element of fadedness and an element of like things you're supposed to do. But I genuinely also believe that some people are just not meant to explore these things. They're not meant to uh, learn about woo or astrology or whatever, maybe because they're an incredible atheist scientist and their work needs to get done in order to help the world. But if they didn't uh, learn about this woo, or if they did learn about this woo side, they might, you know, join a secret society and never give back the world whatsoever something like that um that is another thing that i'm coming around to accept which is that um i'm not willing to say so strongly that there's a plan for all of us but i would say there's checkpoints and turning points hmm. uh i it's a common question around astrology you know fate uh fortune like is it all fixed things like that i don't believe that it's all completely fixed. Like, in fact, the materialist worldview uh, that a lot of people think that is safe from astrology because they're like, oh, you know, like, I don't want my fate to be decided for me. Uh, materialism often is rooted in like the most extreme big bang, billiard balls, molecules bouncing off each other, deterministic sort of thing possible, you know? So that's, that's one layer of it already. Uh, where I'm like, okay, well, we should just talk about this because we, we don't actually have that many choices and we're not in control of that much in our lives anyway. You know, where you're born affects you, how you're brought up affects you, the chance uh, meetings affects you. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, it just happens to be whatever the hell you're looking at at a time you felt really passionate and really weird. And then it just, you know, you're like, boom, this is it. This must be my fate now, um, which maybe, I don't know. I have no idea. What I do think is that we have the free will to react to these checkpoints and to these turning points. We can make decisions about them. We can also choose at any time to latch on to any of the influences that are signified by the planets. And you know, influences here gets back to the idea of causality and all that from the planets, but uh, we, we just say influences causes as a shorthand. Um, but we might say, okay, well, this planet there has this influence and i know these other five planets have these influences what do i want for myself well i'm going to pick that one and i'm going to lean into that thing because the suggestion of astrology is that while you can choose to do anything you're probably not going to want to you know you're probably going to want to do the thing that aligns with your natal chart that uh it, i call it living your chart um you're probably going to want to do the thing that aligns to the transits at the time but you only really get a choice if you're aware of them you know because i can get up 
in the morning, I can look at the sky and I can say, okay, what is this conducive to? And I can choose which thing to do along those lines. If I'm not mistaken, I'm hearing as well something about um, causality and like, I mean, I always think about this myself in terms of like a Buddhist frame of like, um, as I understand it, of like, um, it's often translated as like, uh, dependent origination or something like this, but, but that like, there basically that there are multiple causes on reality. And so it's less like, oh, this, so, I mean, like it, it, sort of like a straw astrology would be like this planet caused this thing to happen directly like A to B, but it seems like much more like there's multiple causes that are all simultaneously impacting each other. Is, is that, is that, am I correct that that's implicit in how you're looking at things as well? That's definitely how I look at it for sure. Um, I think most astrologers would view it that way. There are mm -hmm. times when you can isolate a specific planet, a uh, specific transit from especially the outer planets that are much more slow moving and tend to signify larger changes and more direct impacts. But a lot of the time, if you're just, you know, like say doing a vibe check, for instance, uh, yeah, it's really every planet involved. And a lot of the time when you do a delineation, like for instance, uh, you know, you can do a prediction uh, of how a year is going to go with a solar return. It's when the sun returns to the original point it was at at the uh, exact time and place of your birth. So not necessarily place, there's some d debate about that, doesn't matter. Uh, but the idea is that by looking at all of these transits, you can basically get a broad view of what the year is going to be like. But that's a year long technique, right? So you're looking at themes that evolve over 365 days. And you can also look at any of the planets and then you, you can look at all that and be like, okay, well, you've got some career stuff here, some work stuff here, some romance stuff here, uh, you know, some pleasure here, uh, some family stuff here, friends stuff here, whatever. And then you, you can come away with that and be like, well, that was really vague, um, right? Because it's everything, but that's how life works. Like everything happens all the time, constantly. Uh, everything, everywhere, all at once, so to speak. I uh, love that movie. Um, and so the, the trick is to use tools for narrowing down that lens and deciding what is the most important, you know? So that is where we have things like Time Lord techniques where for certain passages of time, you emphasize a given planet and you say, yes, that's going to be the really important theme. And those techniques tend to work really, really well. Um, you'll always have the background chatter or radiation or signification or whatever of all these other planets, but you, uh, will feel the Time Lord typically most loudly. And of course, you could try and, you know, emphasize another planet willingly as well. Uh, that I'd never try to do that because it's kind of a thing that when you start living within the frame of astrology, it works so well. You're like, why would I try to fuck with it? Uh, but I would like to do some experiments on that at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an overview of the different kinds of astrology? Yeah, totally. Um, so first and foremost, there's natal astrology, which is the practice of taking a chart and then looking at it. And then in modern practice, it's all about character analysis. It's all just personality. Like you have, you know, moon in Virgo. So you're analytical, you distance yourself from your emotions. You uh, need to talk through them. Writing is really good for you, stuff like that. Uh, the sun is in Leo. So you're a loud mouth, a braggart, you know, you're, you like to be arrogant or you like to be generous or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, that is really a accretion of a disconnect from the lineage of astrology that occurred roughly, you could point it back to 1914 during a legal case against Alan Leo, an astrologer in Great Britain, who was sued for fortune telling essentially. Mm -hmm. And his defense was that actually it's not fortune telling. This is a system of character analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that was the crux of his actual argument, but he felt that in order to save astrology from basically what was his equivalent of the Inquisition uh, would be to bury it and say, it's not fortune telling, there's no you know, predictive value in this, it's just for understanding yourself and you know, should be used with psychotherapy and things like that. Um, I don't know the full history of why that stuck you know, versus everything else. Alan Leo was a very uh, influential astrologer, but I don't want to put, pin all the blame on him. And who knows, maybe he did save astrology in the Western world. We just don't know. Um, or at least, I don't know. I haven't done the research yet. But that ended up 
with a world where we basically just do psych psychological modern astrology, where we don't believe anything can be predicted, where we don't believe that we can say anything concrete about the things you'll do in your life or the way you'll live your life or the types of goals you, you might have. Uh, I mean, modern psychology does get into that a lot as well as like modern psychological astrology, but uh, the traditional techniques of like, this is going to happen at this time. This is the best time to do this thing. This is how you can ask a question of the universe and get an answer. All of that was pretty much lost. Uh, at least in its original form. Like we've always had it, but it majorly, the major popular understanding is the psychological astrology. So natal astrology essentially is the inclusion of all of that, but it can also be used to forecast, you know, passages of time in your life, how the general character is going to be, uh, how your, how eminent, how impactful you might be, but also how famous or how popular you might be. Um, it can show you, you know, where you're likely to make friends, where you're likely to uh, have enemies appear, where, you know, whether or not you'll travel abroad throughout your life due to various circumstances, uh, the nature in which you're likely to want to accomplish your goals, uh, the supposed true purpose of your entire incarnation, you know, like big, big, big things like that. Uh, whereas modern psychological astrology, depending on how daring the, the individual astrologer or the researcher or writer is willing to be, may or may not go there at all. So that's natal astrology. Um, there's also, as an extension of that, electional astrology, which is choosing the right time to do things. And sorry, one moment. <clears throat> So this goes back to the idea of what I was talking about, which is basically that you can look at the signs of the stars and say, okay, I know that this thing is going to happen at this time, or rather this uh, sort of, you know, polarity, dynamicism, energy of the moment, whatever is going to be like this, that will be ideal. So I'm going to do this thing at that time. Uh, electional astrology is conceptually pretty simple, but it's a, a deep and complex art because there's so many different factors going on because, you know, you're not just talking about your own birth where you can take time and have subjective uh, moments and like contemplate it. You're talking about like, I need this thing to work and go well. So I need to time it uh, down. Um, and that's actually really valuable because you can test the rules directly for yourself. And I get to the point where I'm like, I even will like elect tweets, you know, like I'll pay attention to them. And then when I have one, I'll tweet and I'll be like, uh, I feel like that one won't do well, you know, and I'll look at the chart. And I'm like, nope, that's not going to do well. And then it doesn't do well. Uh, and then like most recently I was able to even, uh, narrow a, t like a like count for a tweet I elected and I like nailed it. I was like at least 80 at most 300, but I was like pretty sure it's conservatively around 80 got 121, uh, mm. from like, you know, two days ago. So I'm like, I'm pretty happy with that, mm. that sort of accuracy. Um, and that was just an impulsive tweet, but I was like, I'm gonna try it as if in its election and see if I can figure out how well it'll do or won't do based on my studies and research. Uh, you can use it for anything, weddings, job interviews, surgeries, uh, big purchases. It's especially important for things uh, where you don't have control over the outcome, where you just have no way to involve yourself at all, except by choosing the time. So surgeries, uh, dates maybe, uh, big, big purchases, things like that, all that's super dependent on when you do it. So, or rather I should say, that's when astrology can really help out and can give you a little peace of mind because you're like, well, I did, I at least could do something, one single thing, you know? Uh, so like, for instance, uh, before we had this call, I just bought uh, a laptop and had to time it because it was a pretty big purchase and we're hoping they'll last like 10, 10 years or so. Uh, and so I emphasize those factors in terms of what it'll be used for as well as uh, making sure that it has longevity in the chart too. Hmm. Um, let's see. So natal electional, there's also uh, horary astrology, H-O-R-A-R-Y, and that's much more akin to doing tarot in a way, because how it works is you ask, uh, when, when a client or yourself as the astrologer has a question, like an important question, uh, it doesn't have to be important, but like you want to know the answer, you know, like, where's my fish or uh, what what should I do about this situation with this other person? Or like, am I, you know, is my spouse uh, pregnant or like something like that? You know, if you're like, oh, like I don't want to get a pregnancy test for some reason, uh, which may or may not be more relevant in the future we're going into. So 
not that I'm saying that that's a replacement for like actual medical checking. So that's another layer of this too, which is that like, I would never recommend that as an exclusive thing, but as a backup tool that can help you get pretty much almost any information with generally pretty good reliability, it's a really good one to have in your pocket. Um, so the way horary astrology works is you might have a question, Michael, like say, oh, when should we do this podcast? Uh, or, you know, will this podcast go well? And then you would send the question to me. And at the time that I read it as the astrologer, that is the time we cast the chart for, for both the time and the location, because it is the union of your need and my expertise with the signification of the universe, because there's a time for everything, right? If the time was not right, then, or if, if it was a time at which we like literally couldn't know about the question, the both of us, then by definition, the time was not right. Um, so it's that moment of a, a contact, which we call katarche or a uh, inception beginnings, the moment of something new there, there's a much more nuanced meaning to it that I'm uh, forgetting at the moment, but that's kind of basically how you can think of it. It's the study of inceptions as questions. Uh, interestingly, there's some evidence that this actually came as a sort of subsequent development of the practice of doing this just in order to read people's thoughts and like give people suggestions about like what they're worried about or thinking about, and then was added as a way to qualify that. And there's even techniques like uh, with skeptics and horary, there's literally as astrological techniques for guessing what object a skeptic is holding in their hand, hmm. things like that. Uh, and that's also where the thought reading comes in because you can like literally look at a chart of a consultancy for a reading and tell what somebody uh, wants essentially. And so you can tell whether somebody's you know has good intentions or not at the same time. Um, so natal, there's also synastry or compatibility astrology, which is the astrology of just basically, you know, do our charts work well together? Uh, and are we a good match? And, you know, there's all sorts of layers of analysis there for sex, for long-term companionship, for, you know, friendships, for families, uh, dynasty astrology. Actually, I would say dynasty astrology is what truly astro pilled me. That's when I was like, okay, it's done. Uh, because dynasty astrology is basically family astrology where you're looking at the family story through the lens of astrology and all the different charts of all these people. And what you see is time and time again, people are born in the same signs. They're born with key placements right on top of each other. Uh, there, there was one story in this great book uh, on Venus and Mars, I believe by Liz Green and Howard... No, I forget who the other person was, um, but it was a seminar and they were going through an example of three men basically who were experiencing this like epigenetic trauma that had to do with, I believe, alcoholism and, you know, just like very masculine sort of uh, Saturnian themes of like, I can't express my emotions. Uh, you know, I'm a man, I can't, I'm not allowed to do those sorts of things. And they had, I don't believe it was the exact same planet, but they had the same placement that you could like literally draw, like drop a pencil through and it would be on the exact same point in all three charts. Mm -hmm. And that reflected, signified that dynamic for all of them and also the connection between them and how they had to, you know, deal with their familial issues together. Um, <clears throat> I feel like there's one more I'm missing, but those are, those are some of the, the major branches. Hmm. What is the sort of view that your practice of astrology has given you about like what it means to be alive or what the shape of someone's life is very broadly, like not any one particular, particular person, but just anyone that happens to be alive? Yeah. That's a difficult question, honestly, because it does give me, uh, <laughs> sometimes I'm like Dr. Manhattan, you know, like on Mars or whatever planet he was on, like just, I tire of these people and their lives and all that stuff, but that's not what I mean. Like, I mean it in the being remote. And, and watching everything from really far. Because the more I've learned, you know, you touch on dark topics too. You touch on things like death, on violence, on trauma. Because I personally believe that if you're an astrologer, if you're a practicing astrologer, you have to know at least a little bit about that stuff and you have to have some experience with it so you can talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also different types of astrologers for different clients. But in that, I'm, you know, I find myself asking questions like, you know, why do children die young? Like, why do people die for seemingly no reason? Why do people have these experiences? And, you know, there's mystical answers, but honestly, astrology doesn't really give you those answers. And it has led me further in, I suppose, because there's questions like, 
you know, th there's implications like, oh, like this was a spiritual purpose for this person to die really young or to, you know, go through this horrible illness or event. And it's like, humans, we don't want to hear that, right? Like, I am really holding on to my suspension of disbelief on that one, for sure, because I don't want to believe that. But it has told me that we have things happen in our lives that will always be difficult, that will always be good as well, that we will always have key turning points, if we live long enough in our lives, that show things are going to change indelibly. There are techniques where you can say, this is a major life change. You know, like you can literally just like pull it up on a map, see a date, see a date and be like, that's where it happens right there. Look forward to it. So like there are techniques like, and the one I'm referencing right now, for example, is zodiacal releasing with a uh, part of that technique called the loosing of the bond, which specifically is known for when things change drastically for people. And that is such a powerful and consistent technique that uh, I don't talk about zodiacal releasing to people too much because I'm like, that'll, that can fuck you up. Like it can really fuck you up. Uh, mm -hmm. When I started learning that level of technique, which a lot of people consider to kind of be like the master technique of astrology, I had a, had a long time where I had to be like, okay, like, do I have any choices? Like, have I done anything in my life or am I just, you know, in a ride? And a lot of the time it feels that way. I'm certainly in a ride when it comes to the global life. Uh, sorry, my, my answer is meandering a lot, but. That's um, okay, you're great. Uh, that is the big thing for me, which is that like, I don't have to worry as much, you know, even though I kind of led with the darker stuff because that's the hard stuff. In reality, most of our lives are about learning, about having these different experiences. And that's what astrology has shown me. Like it's always an opportunity for learning at every moment. Even enjoying yourself is a way to learn about a better way to enjoy yourself and a better way to enjoy life itself. Uh, even in my opinion, like suffering is an opportunity to investigate the source of that suffering and why that's happening. And astrology frames that in such a way where it's like, no, this is the point, you know, like you have come to this moment at this time. The nice thing is that you can also know when those moments are coming. You can know when the good times are good and when the bad times are bad. And as a result, you can get uh, higher highs and higher lows where you really take advantage of the good times. And then you know, like you shouldn't try anything too ambitious. You should focus on certain types of activities during the bad times, because that's probably the only stuff that's really going to work out. And a lot of that is really dependent, I personally believe, on the spiritual uh, development that you experience as related to the significations of that planet. So, you know, for instance, everybody goes through a Saturn return from 27 to 30, uh, <clears throat> roughly 28 to 30, because it's usually like a, a long multi-year uh, process. And typically it's very hard for a lot of people because Saturn is the planet of duty, of responsibility, of uh, sometimes just pure limitation and punishment and just like tough stuff. But it's also uh, the same responsibility to do good works and to plan and to learn patience and to become diligent and to do things in the, in the right ways that you should have done them the first time. That's what Saturn teaches. And so when people have their Saturn returns, when they've done a really good job of that, they'll often say the Saturn return is the best period of their life so far. And then people who haven't done such a good job of that are like Saturn return was super difficult. It was the worst. It was, you know, really hard. Um, but at the end of the day, Saturn is there to, you know, change things or signifies that change and shows the ways in which you're likely to experience that change. But every single planet has its own rate and motion. Uh, like Neptune, when Neptune was trining towards my ascendant, Neptune is all about the ethereal, the uh, unseen, the unspeakable was when I got like really, really, really into uh, altered states, I would say. Um, and like, like super, super deep. And then as soon as it stopped, as soon as it passed, I was like, oh, I feel different now. Like I'm good. Like I understand that I, I can be free of this. But like the thing was that during that time, I, you know, it's a very slow transit because Neptune moves very slowly. And I, I had had to like encounter myself and be like, do I have a problem? You know, like, is this like a legit problem for me? Uh, and based on looking at my chart and the, the timing of it, I was like, probably not. Like, this is probably just Neptune's transit at this time signifying this. And I should just enjoy it while I can because it's not going to be here forever. Um, and then it pretty much happened that way. Neptune is retrograding back again towards my ascendant. So it's happening again, but it's going to go back forward. And so I'm kind of like just taking it easy in the process because I'm like, I don't have to stress about this because I understand my own tendencies. So 
it's such life is so much about who we are and how we decide to bring that into interaction with the cosmos. And by cosmos, I can just mean reality, you know, the people around us, the experiences that we have, the emotions that we have, you know, like core Buddhist precept is that thoughts are actions, right? Like they bubble up into actions that they actually have an effect uh, in a very literal way. So even at the level of the mind, there's an opportunity for, for learning and, and knowledge and wisdom. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. So something like um, everyone, everything in life changes. Everyone will go through good times and bad times. Everyone has lessons to learn and no one will have a uniformly good or bad life, but every situation is an opportunity to learn and grow. And with astrology, you can predict and dance with the circumstances of your life. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that is not to say that all lives are going to have the e same amount of ease or beneficence, you know, like just look around, right? We have people that are poor, homeless, and then we have people like Jeff Bezos uh, who are made of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I haven't figured out a way to talk about that in a way that's satisfactory because, you know, there's a lot of utopian ideas that we can all live in this equal society. And I do think that's true, but it requires spiritual development and generosity and grace from everybody, you know? Like, we can't win until Jeff Bezos is like, oh, actually, I should use this money for something else besides just Amazon or whatever. Like, I, I don't know what he does with all of it, obviously. I just have a default, you know, skepticism of billionaires because it suggests a certain type of inner function that cannot stop, you know? And that you would say is their learning process. But for somebody who, you know, can barely squeeze two dollars together, they may not appreciate the Jeff Bezos learning process whatsoever. <laughs> Um, so that's a, that's one of the things that I'd also don't talk about, right? Because like people do have different fortunes, uh, and actually touching back on what you were talking about before is the idea of multiple influences too, because it's actually a Hellenistic idea of fate too, which is that you didn't just have like this materialistic deterministic ping pong, uh, you know, molecules ending up with us now, you had multiple types of fates. You had a fate that was associated with uh, just all of fortune, like the allotment of what would happen throughout your life. Like it, it, your lot was what could actually happen to you and you could not experience anything that was not your lot and nobody else could experience anything that was not their lot. But then you also had the force of ananke or necessity, which is a type of fate that is about things that have to happen like almost on the level of physics. So you could theoretically have an allotment but you could get hit by a car for instance, you know, or you could stick your hand in a, a, a conveyor belt, which is what happened to me <laughs> uh, as a five-year-old. So, uh, and that was also signified, by the way, I found that and it was fucking crazy to look at. But anyways, um, I can talk about it because it's my own life. But um, it was, uh, it's a whole, sorry, I lost my train of thought because I got excited by just how absurd that example was. Um, no problem. What was I saying? <laughs> Um, you were just saying that different people have different fates, basically. Ananke, right, yeah. Um, and then you would also have the lot of spirit, for example, which might be your daemon. Uh, so another thing I've been learning more about recently is the idea that we all have, you know, this inner wisdom, this inner voice uh, that's, that is essentially advising us on things. It's our intuition, our gut feeling that tells us, you know, yes, do this, don't do that. That's really important. That doesn't matter, that sort of thing. And... I think men, like everybody, I personally believe that everybody has one, but most of us due to the culture we live in have shut that out because you know it's a gut thing. It's, it's almost like magical thinking. Like you have to rationalize if you want to find the truth. You have to be able to think about it if you're able to figure out what is actually happening, right? Because there's no way that something that can instantly tell you something that usually later turns out to be right uh, could be of any value in that sort of frame. But the lot of spirit in the Hellenist view was literally your daemon. It was literally an entity that is you on a higher plane that is trying to live your life out and live out this story. Um, so that's another type. And so the, the daemon would be the fate, form of fate, you could say, or lot or influence that 
pushes you into the, the path of life that you're supposed to be on. You know, it causes things to happen to you so that you can then get the, the job done of what you're here to do. And that's actually a very direct way you can delineate the lot of spirit when you're doing astrology as well. Um, there's a bunch of other types of these influences and forces that are all kind of combining all at once. So learning to forecast that is not necessarily the most easy thing and you can miss things sometimes, right? Like it's a complex art, but um, it suggests that there are ways to understand when to take certain actions and not to take other actions, right? Like if you know that the lot of necessity uh, is looking pretty bad, Ananke is looking bad at this time, you might be careful with the knives, you know, or you might be careful going down the stairs or things like that, uh, because that's the that's the impact of physics. And it may show a tendency towards things going wrong as like mishaps, but you can control for that as well. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Can you say more, uh, just backtracking a little bit about what uh, zodiacal releasing is? Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> so zodiacal releasing is a, actually let me drink before I do this. It's a pretty deep technique where you take the wheel of the zodiac in a natal chart, <clears throat> and then based on where these lots are that I'm discussing, you would release as in uh, perfect or move the lot through each sign of the zodiac uh, one at a time. And so <clears throat> the way that this works is you get a subdivision of life where each sign relates to a certain number of years based on something called the uh, minor planetary periods of each planet. And these are like magic numbers. We have no idea where they came from. They just work really well. And like literally none of us know where, where they come from come from as far as I know, uh, but it's magic and it works. So we use it um, because fundamentally that's what astrology is about. It's pragmatism, you know, like how can we solve these problems? At least the type that I'm interested in. Um, so you release this lot for that certain number of years in each sign, and you essentially have a kind of life story that is portrayed as it goes through all of these periods. And the chart is also broken up into four angular triads, which uh, the astrologer, Hellenistic astrologer, and like pretty much huge deal in the uh, Hellenistic astrology world, wrote the book called the Hellenistic Astrology. Um, describes it as like chapters of a book where, or, you know, parts of a book where like, this is one chapter and then these are, you know, the individual parts, three parts each. And then the first one is kind of the, the lead up period. This is a peak period where like the major stuff happens, could be good or bad, it's just impactful. And then the follow up period is what follows it uh, and it pretty much elaborates on that previous period. And so each, you know, roughly anywhere from 45 to 80 years, depending, uh, you switch through one of these angular triads, enter really like a whole new life story. But then there's also finding the lot of spirit by that perfection as you go around. So it's a little abstract, but basically once you have that first level set up, you can look at that and say, okay, you know, this is the very broad story of your life. And you can also release from different lots. So you can emphasize different uh, parts of your life. So you could emphasize the general life purpose. You could emphasize um, how, you know, like romance is going to go with a lot of arrows, for instance. Um, but then you can subdivide the periods too. So for each period, you can then go a level deeper and then again subdivide those by a reduced uh, minor planetary number. And so within say a 15 year period, you get uh, 12 periods that all span up to 15 periods as well, or 15 years. And then you can go deeper and deeper until you're on the layer of the L4, which is usually like one to three, four, five days at a time. And you can just forecast your entire week that way. You can really like look and see how things are going to go. Um, you can even get deeper to like the L5 and L6, which is new kind of like experimental astrological technology that's getting built right now, where you can like micro time down to the minute and like even the second if you wanted to. Um, but that's more than, you know, most people would ever need. I'm hearing that as something like you can use astrology to see the different chapters of your life and their significance at different scales. Is yep. that is that right? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. And how is that different than the other kinds of astrology you're talking about? Why is it a separate technique? I mean, I, it just uh, 
I, I heard things about the technical description that you're saying that sound different, but can you explain it to me? Yeah, simply? totally. So there are many types of techniques uh, that are in the category of what are called time lord techniques. So I mentioned, you know, you could do a yearly chart reading, which is the solo return, which uh, actually is part of a called the perfection uh, houses technique where, or annual perfections technique, where every year you, when you're born, you start in a first house year. And then the next year you go to a second house year, then a third house year, fourth house year, and just goes around the entire Zodiac repeating until you die. And then uh, each year you can look at the solar return with that activated perfection sign as a way to examine what the important ruling planet is going to be and what the important themes and topics will be. So like, you know, if you're in an activated second house uh, year, then you'll be dealing with possessions, money, assets, things like that. That's the second house. Whereas zodiacal releasing is similar to annual perfections, except the way it ticks forward is in these much larger periods based on the minor planetary years. And so mm. those will basically span a much larger period of time. Um, you can do a very similar sort of thing with, for, uh, with annual perfections and solar returns where you can then subdivide them into monthly perfections and then potentially even subdivide the monthly perfections down into daily perfections. And that works quite well. It's actually a very powerful timing technique, but because the diacal releasing is bigger, you might overlay all of that on top of that and then use these as little layers in between. The idea being that you know, on the L1 level one of zodiacal releasing that spans, you know, decades, you have a planet that is the overall time lord for that period. So if it's Venus, it's like uh, that period of your life is really about beauty, aesthetics, love, romance, social connections, uh, anything really Venusian in nature. And Venus will be in charge of that whole period. But on these sub periods, there can be a different Lord because you're moving through the different periods. And so based on how the different planets see Venus in that situation, they may or may not like Venus. They may or may not get along with Venus. They may or may not be harmoniously uh, aspecting them or even able to, to see them at all. And so that will suggest that during that period of your life, you might you know, lean more into Venus, but in, incorporate Martian aspects. You know, you're like, oh, I'm really going to go for it and like uh, achieve something beautiful. Like that's Mars achievement, aggression, action, or, you know, it might be the month like you finally go out and decide to go dating a lot because, you know, it's like the more aggressive component of that thing where if Mars and Venus are harmoniously configured, Mars might be like, okay, yeah, let's get a date. Like, let's make this happen. If they're not, or they're completely averse, for example, like they don't see each other at all, Mars might be like, no, I'm going to do career stuff. And that entire, you know, lower three-year period, you're just focused on career. You don't think about love much at all. But then Venus can reassert herself at lower levels, right? Because it's still going around on these fractals. So you have like this massive, uh, infinitely subdividable kind of passage through the natal chart that you can use to read the signs of how these various periods are going to go. And then you can layer in multiple techniques. And then you also add in the transits as another layer to say, okay, well, where are the planets literally right now? And how does that, you know, augment the, the natal promise? Because that's really what it comes to. Uh, it's the natal promise in your chart. You can only experience what is described in your chart and the things that are there. I mean, you can get other experiences by working with the planets and working with them via transit as they move around. That's a way to to access different parts of yourself as a form of uh, remediation. But overall, you're looking at what the natal chart is telling you as a story. But in those chapters, it's kind of like you have the little characters that are at play. But you could think of them as like inner functions or even maybe IFS parts. You know, I know people will work with astrology. Some do IFS and they'll be like, oh yeah, Mercury is this part for me. And Venus is this other part. Like I understand them to have the same function uh, mm -hmm. in my life. Can you say more about what the natal promise means? Yeah, so it essentially, there's a lot of ways you can view it, but I like the way that my friend uh, Tal Lumat puts it, which is that uh, the, the natal chart is a question from the universe. Hmm. As in, he thinks of it in terms of a horary uh, reading, as in like when you're born, you're not really looking at a birth, right? Because it's just a symbolic moment. It's a place and time. It's a chart. It's not the actual person. And so you're reading it as what is the universe requesting? Hmm. You know, what is the universe asking? And then how do we individually answer it as people? Um, 
Another way is, you know, a little bit more causal, which is that because of these planets at this time that have these signifying factors and or influence, therefore you will have this experience, blah, blah, blah. That is your natal promise. Hmm. And can you say as well what perfection is? Yeah, so perfection is the, the motion of moving the lot forward hmm. um, around akin to the zodiacal releasing technique. Okay. And, and going up multiple levels now, uh, very earlier, much earlier in the conversation, you know, you were saying, oh, I got into tarot and then I got into astrology. Are, is there anything else besides those two methodologies that has really formed uh, part of your toolkit for looking at these things? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> most recently, I'm, I've been getting into what I would describe as entity contact, I suppose, uh, because the more you do astrology, the more these planets and their archetypes tend to come alive. And actually the other type of astrology that I did not mention is astrological magic. So that is really the same thing as electional astrology, but you're using you know, the, the flavor of the cosmos at the time in order to put intention and will out into the universe and say, I, I want this thing to happen. So I will time it to put my uh, message out then. And it's most likely to go and deliver that result for me. The manner in which this happens is often very devotional as it's called, as in creating a relationship with the planets or praying to them sometimes. Uh, I prefer the word relational more specifically because in the work of going through these planets, you begin to realize that they talk back, you know, like you get intuitions, you begin to develop a sense of the character of these archetypes and myths. Because if you open up your intuition to all of this, then you realize that not only can you understand this with this with your brain, but you can have inner experiences in your body that tell you, that teach you about the nature of the signs and the planets. You can have uh, visions or imagination, uh, whichever term you like to describe it as, of these things that are happening as you go about uh, learning about these planets and, you know, they'll show up to you in dreams, they'll show up to you in random thoughts, things like that. Like the deeper you get into astrology, you begin to realize that there's something behind the planets that's a little bit more alive than they've been letting on. Mm -hmm. um, they meaning everybody who kind of talks about astrology publicly. So there's a really big part of this that has also been me realizing like actually well, I should back up. So like, it didn't start with this. Uh, I did do a couple other practices, like meditation is very important. Visualization exercises are important for what I'm describing. Um, but I was going through a couple different books or courses. One was Franz Barden's Initiation into Hermetics, which is basically a book that in a very like structured, rigorous, disciplined way, guides you from knowing nothing at all to being able to directly communicate with spirits, uh, as in like, you know, angels or deities or whatever the heck. So around this time, I was thinking like, all right, whatever, I don't know about that, but I'm into the spirituality stuff. I'm into the idea of like developing my visualization skills and potentially being able to do magical stuff as I was learning more about that all at the same time. And, um, during this process, you know, I would have these kind of like weird experiences where I like felt like something was with me or like was trying to talk to me. Or uh, the, the most notable example I have is I was meditating and doing a focus on like a certain type of visualization that's an energy building visualization. And I was meditating there for maybe 45 minutes or so. And then I begin to hear behind me like an auditory hallucination, not like in my mind's, uh, mind's ear or anything like that, something that was breathing that sounded like a, like a very big something that was just like breathing continuously, but very neutrally and kind of just like checking me out, just seeing what I was doing, you know, like that's the vibe I got from it. And me being a good kind of like meditator at the time, I was like, I'm not going to pay attention to this phenomenon. <laughs> I'm just going to keep meditating. Uh, weirdest thing I've ever experienced, but then it like went on for like a minute. And so I was like, all right, what the hell? And I turn around and as, as soon as I start to turn my head, it begins to fade, you know? So now I think that that was definitely a something. Uh, at the time I was like, I don't know what it was, you know, no clue. Now I'm like, yeah, that was like probably a spirit or something like that based on the, the metaphysics and the framework that I have now. Um, but going forward to the present day, a big part of this has been just like directly talking to the planets or like asking them questions. Because when I say they have things to teach, I mean that in a very literal way. If you ask the sun about being 
solar being uh, bright, happy, generous, fixed, being radiant, uh, generous, things like, oh, I said generous, but things of that nature, the sun will talk to you. Like if you know how to listen, it will give you ideas that you have not had. It'll mm -hmm. tell you things in words that you don't use, you know? Uh, the interesting thing is it does use your language because it has to communicate with you through the medium of your own brain, but there's something weird going on with all this stuff. Um, so that's been a really big component of this because like, for instance, I have one example uh, where in my chart, I have a Virgo Mercury, which is uh, very strong. It's an exalted Mercury. And I've begun to realize that I can actually, you know, this is the where the starts to sound really crazy, uh, is that like, I feel like I'm in communication with something, an entity, which I would identify as having the nature of Hermes, as I understand it, you know, the God, the messenger God, which is also Mercury. Um, the reason I now believe that is because I've been learning new astrology techniques out of the blue, where I'll be having a shower, for instance, and then all of a sudden, I'll just like get just streams of information about astrology techniques that have never been heard before, uh, to me, at least. And <clears throat> I actually literally posted a thread about this this morning where I was like talking about a bunch of gnosis or a uh, word for basically just kind of like spiritual knowledge or revelation uh, on the topic of lots and how to interpret them and all this stuff. And the tricky part of this is I have to kind of think about with that, you know, suspension of disbelief, but it gets even trickier because when it comes to topics like magic, like relational interaction, communication with entities, the more you suspend your uh, disbelief, by which I mean not necessarily leaning into the belief, the less you get out of it. Because the theory goes that if these are real entities, real beings with a type of personhood and their own intelligence that maybe we don't understand, then you being like, I don't believe you're real, uh, but I'll try and get this information from you regardless is just like this solipsistic thing in my own experience. These entities are known to go, well, peace, you know, <laughs> and just like bounce. Um, and I really have seen that to be true. Like I've received admonishments at times, you know, I've been told fascinating things I never would have considered. Uh, I'm in a group with a bunch of people actually who are kind of along the same wavelength. And it's interesting because we'll basically cross reference the gnosis that we receive in our learnings in order to triangulate this type of astrology. So, you know, I do have I use a language that is comfortable for most people, but internally I've been doing this for long enough that like I have, I'm, I've gone through like subjective physical changes uh, where like I literally feel in my body these sorts of things. You could say, sure, that's biofeedback, all that. But like the thing is that confirmation bias is actually just like the bottom ladder of a completely magical, legitimately magical experience, mm -hmm. you know? So when we're saying, oh, this is just confirmation bias, or you're just reading into it, or you're just like letting yourself go there, it's like, yeah, that's the point. Magical mm -hmm. thinking is good, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it is what helps you access that thing. Now, you do need containers, right? Like, you need a container wherein you can say, okay, I'm going to completely inflame myself with prayer, so to speak. I'm going to engage in this experience really, really deeply and uh, be respectful uh, in the moment and honor the experience that I seem to be having in my body and my mind that, you know, as far as I know, is as real as anything else I've ever experienced. And then on the outside, I can take it back and say like, okay, well, let's take note of everything I experienced and thought about and decide, you know, was it me being subjective or not? Or was it them uh, in reality? Can I correlate this to something else I was thinking about? Sure, maybe, but can I correlate it in the way that it was described to me as in like me figuring that out independently in like the one second of beginning communication? Not so much. Um, I have one pretty good example of this that's very on the nose. Um, I was in a conversation with uh, this group of friends and we were talking about a given book and I have this book on PDF, but I wanted to reference the physical copy because I was like, oh, let me look up this passage. We're talking about something. And then I go around and tear my house apart for like 10 minutes straight. I'm like, where the hell is this book? Like I'm looking for this freaking book. I, I want to read it, you know? And so I'm just like sitting here, uh, just like hanging out and like, you know, kind of annoyed, like, where is this book? And I turn around, I look at this bookshelf right here, actually this white one, which I don't really look at much because it's kind of like my random esoteric stuff that I don't have time to get to. Um, 
And I notice wedged between these two corners is this book. Uh, do I have it right here or did I put it elsewhere? I think I, I've put it somewhere else already. But basically this book was the law, uh, or no, sorry, the way of Hermes. Hmm. And my first name is Way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I bought, the, bought this book like, I think maybe two, three years ago. So like, it's forgotten. You know, I've not thought about this book in years. And it's also <clears throat> hidden behind these two books as well. Like it's an in shadow, but my eye went straight to it. And then I'm thinking about Hermes and Hermes is like, like, you know, you, you get the feeling, like the encouragement. It, it literally feels like kind of like this, this nudge. Uh -huh. And so I pull it out and then I'm like, what the hell? I want my other book. And then uh, the way it feels is it's kind of like, you know, a thought you have in your own head, but like almost like it comes from a different part or from a different uh, person. It just has a different vibe. And, you know, I'll just call it Hermes. Hermes is like, oh, just go ahead and read it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, how much do I have to read? <laughs> and it, it's like, ah, it's a good book, just read it. And then, so I flip it open and then I go in and I start to read it. And yeah, it's a good book. It's, it's basically about emanation theory. It's about the uh, Gnostic wisdom that Hermes Trismegistus, who was a real living person, living man, uh, supposedly received from Naus, I think, the, uh, the demiurge or like creator spirit that created the universe and wanted to tell a bunch of stuff about, you know, like how to be good and how not to be bad and all that stuff. It's, it's really about um, spirituality and like kind of seeking your connection to that divinity and understanding your place in it. Um, but as I'm reading this, it's going through a story of the, the kind of like classical Greek element creation of the world. And as it's talking, it goes. And so it goes through all of the, the signs and then there's the loosing of the bond. And I'm like, wait, what? Because that is loosing of the bond is a technique from zodiacal releasing, which I was actively researching at the moment. And this book is from 100 to 300 AD. 1700 years ago and i'm reading this exact thing that references a technique i'm learning about and not just that but it was specifically in a very particular context that i needed to think through that was keeping me from moving forward with my study in a particular subject related to the loosing of the bond and here was a hint directly saying yes do it this specific way hmm. and so i tried it and it worked and i was like well fuck, you know, <laughs> like I've been waiting on this for like, uh, you know, I've been, I've been like procrastinating, figuring this next part out for like a, a month, probably maybe three weeks or so. And there it is coming with this random call to attention. And then this book that has my name and Hermes name on it. And it solves my direct problem. And <clears throat> then later, a few days later, I was like, okay, now that Hermes has played his tricks on me because he's a trickster God, he plays tricks. That's literally what he does. Uh, I, thought, well, I'll, I'll finally find this physical book, I'm sure. And so I decided to go uh, look through my Kindle library at some point. I'm just kind of like looking for some light reading. And then I realized that I have the, the book there, which I knew, but then looking at that book made me realize I never owned the physical copy. Mm. I never had it ever. I never bought it, but I was convinced that I did. And at this point I'm like, I think Hermes just like straight up gave me a delusion, you know, mm -hmm. in order to send me on this quest. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot you get out of that, right? <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, first of all, being that, <clears throat> you know, entities can fuck with you directly. Like they can mess with you because they're, they're powerful beings that have more access than you, uh, especially gods and planets. Um, but also that they can teach you things that they can help you solve problems that they will put challenges and riddles and things to solve in, directly in your path as well. Um, and that's something that's very fascinating to me because I'm like, you know, on, on the one hand, it's like, sure, it's cool to have the subjective experience of potentially gods and planets and, and whatever else I might may or may not be imagining, but it's quite another thing to have it directly solve problems, pragmatic problems and have it work. Uh, and and fix things for me. So I would say that this is a very new part of my practice overall. It's only really in the last like three months that I've started to engage with what I would, what I jokingly call the voices in my head. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is that it's 
very, you know, like you can containerize it, which is what for me distinguishes it from something that could be unhealthy or a slippery slope, which is that, you know, you can create rituals at which you say, okay, I only want to communicate during these times. And if I ask them to stop talking, they do. Um, because there's you know, some people would theorize like these beings don't understand time and incarnation and what a job is and why we might care about that. Uh, and so you have to kind of like tell them and set your own boundaries. And, you know, it just like further implies this element of like personhood, you know, a lot of the time we think of gods as like these all seeing powerful beings, which are like, do this, and then you do it. And then, you know, a tree grows in the middle of your living room. And you're like, what the fuck, right? Like, that's kind of our experience, or our conception of what a god should be like. But in, <clears throat> in my view, if we have these tiny little experiences, these strands uh, that we can pull on that point to real externally verifiable information and tools, then we have to consider what these beings actually are in that context. Um, and it turns out there's plenty of thinking on this already. And the key idea is that these entities really cannot operate on the material realm, that's our job. That's why we're here as human beings. We're here to experience incarnation and experience time, especially. Because out there, it's like 24 seven eternity imagination land or something like that. I don't I don't know. Um, and they don't know down here. They're like, I don't know what the fuck that guy's doing. Like, <laughs> why, I don't get why he won't just read the book I'm trying to give Grocery him. Grocery shopping, uh, what is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> Food, yeah. Um, yeah, so that that's a new, element, which is kind of challenging for me because I do feel like it's, you know, I thought astrology is one thing, but talking to spirits kind of sends you off the deep ends, but for, in my worldview, but like people are weird about this stuff, you know, like people who believe in telepathy and woo stuff and like spirit contact will be like astrology. That's bullshit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like people who believe in astrology are like, these aren't real. These are just signs, you know? They're, they don't have any effects. They're not gods. You can't talk to them. That's stupid. Um, as usual, I'm just trying to remain in the middle. Hmm. Which of the different methods that you've learned and explored do you reach for when? That's a great question. Um, For general forecasts, like how stuff is going right now, I reach for, you know, natal astrology with transits, zodiacal releasing. So like if I'm trying to decide, for example, whether or not I want to go out, say, for, a, you know, a night out or something like that, which I rarely do nowadays, I might pull the chart and be like, okay, is this conducive for this? Does this look good against my chart? Does it look good in the general chart? Excuse me, things like that. Um, for instance, a few days ago, I went to a really nice restaurant here with uh, Raz, and it was kind of like an impulsive decision. And we're like, oh, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, well, I'm feeling impulsive, so let me check the chart first. The chart was great, and it was awesome. It was fantastic. Uh, so, you know, that worked out well. Um, if it's something that has to do with information that's kind of difficult to access, uh, like you can't really access it through time, or it's not about you, like if you need to know about something, especially something in the past, the tarot is really good for that because you can say, you know, oh, what was the story here? Or what does this thing mean? Or what is the significance of X, Y, Z thing? And you can pull tarot cards. Um, it's also useful when you don't have a time for something in astrology, like, you know, say you, you have, you're working with somebody who has a birth chart that they don't know the birth certificate for, they don't know the time for, um, or you're trying to delineate something about, you know, a business or anything you're trying to predict. You can use tarot supplementarily. Like I know some people will even put tarot cards around the entire wheel as a way to flesh out the delineations of all of the 12 houses. But you can also use tarot as extra fact finding for astrology. Like I've had success drawing tarot and then looking at the astrological significations of the card in order to find the rising time or the, the rising sign or time of birth of a thing. Uh, because you only need to know the specific sign that's rising for most of these techniques to work really well, uh, not necessarily the precise time. Um, Another thing that I've begun doing for really simple, quick checks of things is uh, muscle testing. And muscle testing is the idea that if all of reality is information, your body is plugged into that. And so you can actually access and reference your own body in order to find out information about the reality that's happening around you. So you could say, like ask a question, like is, is my handle saddle sued and pull on your, your fingers like this, you basically interlock them and do it very lightly and kind of like pull gently 
gently. And then you should feel some strength there. Like they shouldn't pull apart. But if you say, oh, my handle is tiger or something, like, like they immediately kind of weaken, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a weird, very subjective thing. And these practices are tricky because it does require meditation. It requires spiritual practices, or at least it requires um, calming neutrality practices, I should say. Because when you're doing these things, you really have to be in a neutral state where you want to know the truth. Because when it comes to certain types of astrology, tarot and muscle testing, uh, like horary astrology, if you really want something to be true, it'll give you that answer because it's that effect of your thought affecting reality. So depending on how neutral you truly are, you may end up just screwing yourself over by saying like, oh, I really want this thing. Uh, is this a good idea or should I get this thing? And then it tells you like, hell yeah, you absolutely should get that thing. But really it's just telling you that you want that thing, mm. you know? Um, so centering practices are really important there. Uh, so I'll use muscle testing for things like, you know, quick checks, like, you know, is it good to go out tonight? Uh, is it fine to, park here for a little bit. Like, honestly, I use it for a lot of stupid stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It hasn't been wrong so far. Like one thing I'll, I'll use it for is like whether or not candidates and in interviews will no show or not. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't usually do that. Right. So the three times I've done it and it's been like, right, it was right. Like it's mm -hmm. when it said, no, they're not going to be there. And it was weak. I was like, okay, well, we'll see. And then I sat there for five minutes and I was like, mm, well, it works pretty well. Huh. Um, yeah. So it's really the factor of time subject and convenience. There's other tools you can use too. Like I actually have uh, these little, one sec, Astro Dice, which I've been posting out a little bit. Uh, and right now we're having a conversation about, let's see, it was Aquarius. So that's kind of like the nature, like the grid, the nature of reality, I like to read that, or spirit communication, especially. Um, and then you have Pluto, which is occult forces and powers. And then you have three, which is uh, talking amongst your community with your friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there you go. Um, that was a roll. I didn't make that up. I had to pull it up to the screen, but like that's literally the delineation. It just works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I notice. So I, I, this might be a little tricky for me to describe. So bear with me here for a second. But so to rewind a little bit, when I, I told you this on our Astropilled episode, I think, but like. Let's see. I guess this was two years ago now. I posted on my, at the time, locked alt, which no longer exists. Uh, I think I'm having a midlife crisis at uh, 28 or whatever. Tw and a friend of mine was like, hmm, have you heard of the Saturn return? Uh, and I looked it up and I was like, oh, fuck. Astrology is <laughs> a real thing. Like, this is just, okay, yeah. fine. Like, I went from not believing astrology to... Uh, believing in astrology and as a certain account that i've seen has said i do not deny astrology i resent it um, <laughs> and yeah uh, i i understand completely. yeah so um the for me all of this stuff is like very much uh fair game epistemologically it's like okay like i i'm not interested in disputing this sort of thing um let's see however However, yeah, I get sort of like dialing into this resent thing. Like I notice it's a little bit uneven with tarot versus astrology, but especially astrology, but to some extent tarot or other things, there's a feeling of, yeah, I guess I would say like foreboding or um, fear of, yeah, like determination or fate or something like that. It's like mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a resistance around that of like not wanting my life to be fated or being afraid of what it might signify or something like that. And mm -hmm. um, I imagine that for you, it's more like, oh, I could like, well, one, I'd rather know if there's something coming and two, I might be able to have some uh, effect on it. But I wonder just what you would say about that sort of sense of foreboding or uh, resistance or fear or uh, anything in that territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's perfectly understandable. Um... I would never want to push somebody, you know, into knowing something that they weren't prepared to know or didn't want to find out. Like, you know, sometimes I see things in charts where bad stuff looks uh, possible and I try to give a little forecast, but, you know, it's, it's one both 
unethical to try to predict the exact nature of something horrible that's going to happen to somebody, in my opinion, and then tell them that thing. Uh, you know, it's one thing to practice and observe in your own, you know, that's just kind of a dark part of sharpening the tools of the trade. Um, but for me, it really came from like control issues. Like I had to tweet a while ago where I joke that, you know, sure, doing astrology for spirituality and understanding the cosmos is cool, but I did it because I had control issues, uh, something like that. And because I was really like, you know, when it came to dating, I didn't want to waste time with mm. people that like weren't, uh, in my opinion, worth the time at the time. Uh, mm. And then I realized that, oh crap, like I can figure out what's going to happen and I can use this as like a power tool on my own life. Um, and it's been a very interesting thing because as I've gone deeper into it and into spirituality, all it showed me is that I don't actually have as much control as I hoped I mm. did or thought mm. I could have. Mm. Um, there's a ton that you can do actually, like I've, I've referenced, uh, you know, the communication with the planets, like one reason for that, that's actually a very core part of the way that uh, Jyotish or Indian astrology is practiced is the idea of planetary remediation, where you have a planet that's in a poor condition in your chart, it signifies things that won't go so well, and you do certain things to build a relationship with that planet, the or the god representing the planet, or however you want to conceptualize it, and they help teach you how to deal with that and also like literally make it easier because the idea like there's there's uh very common ideas you know reincarnation behind astrology which is that you know these planets signify a bunch of different things and there's fair uh concrete evidence for like lots of reincarnation stories including like you know data that these people could not get so i'm like yeah sure that that's a fine model um i usually work with my clients on what they want to believe uh around that but you know it shows that you can work with that energy no matter where it came from uh and improve your circumstances rather directly um so we might not have control over when things happen but we can control or influence or modify the ways in which they occur to us. Um, you know, a random tidbit of wisdom from my mom, who is actually a Chinese astrologer, uh, which started like later in life or around when I was like 18 or so, which, you know, was probably an influence in me being a little bit more open to it. Um, she says that her master, who does a totally different type of Chinese astrology, like vastly different, um, that you can change your fate, but it's very hard. Uh, it just takes a lot of work and a lot of application. Um, and that's kind of, you know, in a way the, the natural, you know, personal evolution journey. But when it comes to that fear and that foreboding specifically, I would tell people, you know, if, if the idea of knowing the future doesn't excite you, then leave it alone. You know, maybe there's certain times you'd like to know about, like if, if, uh, you want to know about the good things to ask an astrologer about that. Just tell them, don't tell me about the low points. Just tell me about the high points and leave it kind of fuzzy, you know, cause that's usually stuff that people can look forward to. But for some people that's even too much pressure. They don't want to think like, Oh, there's this thing coming up that I need to prepare for. Um, I find that a lot of the time it's really just like the, the right, uh, you know, right time happens regardless, depending on how closely you pay attention to it. Because the way that our lives work out is that the planets signify just what you're already doing and what you already feel like doing and the tempo at which you're already doing it. So people often will have like this fear response to astrology where they're like, oh, I don't want to know that my life is, you know, like, uh, like on a, on a track, but kind of already is, you know, mm -hmm. like you're already just living your chart out one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, one direction or the other, it is a control issue in my personal opinion, right? Like it's, it's either wanting to control the future or having a fear of being controlled by the future. Mm -hmm. And so along those lines, I think that if you just want to live your life in a way where you never have to think about astrology, never have to worry about it, then, you know, I, I'd say power to you or anybody else who wants that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm realizing as you speak about this, that I think the sort of implicit view that I tend to have, which I, I think is both commendable, but I, this is something I'll have to keep investigating, but it's something just like, oh, I want to live the best life I can according to my own lights and wisdom that I've received. And then like, um, yeah, yeah, it's sort of developed over time of like, oh, where there's friction or suffering, that's where I need to learn something from. But I'd, I'd rather like learn that from going through that than like, uh, 
yeah for some reason like oh oh shit my chart says this like i three years from now this thing's gonna happen like uh oh like i yeah. i don't know i don't uh it, it it's a definitely like an embodied discomfort with that sense um like i i yeah the experience is just i want to do the best that i can and like try my best and then learn what happens as it happens and uh, yeah 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 the <clears throat> excuse me sorry lots of throat stuff um the main thing i would say is that the value of astrology during those moments so you know like a thing that can be useful is to check in when it's happening when you're like mm -hmm. okay because a lot of the time people don't know what the hell is going on you know mm -hmm. they're like why is this happening to me what is yes. what am i supposed to learn from this uh and astrology as a system of meaning gives us the very precise things that we're supposed to learn from mm -hmm. or you know at least go through an experience so we can get a forecast of like where our attention should be and how we should conceptualize something but if you're the type of person where you really value your own individual path and your own ability to orient yourself in the world independently then you know you don't you don't have to do that either um mm -hmm. i think it's it's a it's a tool that can be used in a way that can level you up in a really big way, but it really depends on your own perspective on time and how how things occur and like the the nature of of tempo. Because like I would say, oh, if you know that this really bad thing is coming up in three years or so, I would say, well, what is that bad thing about? What do you think is going to contribute to that throughout your life as it's happening? Is there a way you could head that off? And instead of it being a bad thing, you've already prepared for it and you can turn it into an advantage. Because like I mentioned before, I don't view uh, the experiences we have as something we can really control much, but I do believe how we react to them. And we can certainly impact the outcomes because if we couldn't, then there would be no point to arts like electoral astrology or the idea of choosing influence. Uh, and this is an idea that goes back through lots of recorded history on the, the topic of astrology. Mm. There's a related issue that comes up for me that's a little bit more practical, but it's like part of the reason that I had, so I, a friend gave me a tarot deck that I have here uh, and I really like this particular tarot deck because the um it actually so what they did was they gave me two tarot decks and they're like here here's two that i have and then just like see which one speaks to you and one of, they were both beautiful both absolutely beautiful but one of them was just like it was very abstract to me it was like sort of geometrical and i was like oh, i don't it's like a foreign language but this other one was like the opposite of foreign language like i okay like i know what this means thank yeah. you yeah. <laughs> loud and clear and um uh I like that because that deck, because it, it feels, yeah, like I just draw a card and I'm like, I understand what this means. And um, it's really interesting because certain cards like keep coming up in certain kinds of questions. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, there's however many cards, like this one keeps coming up in these <clears throat> kinds of questions. Yeah. Like, okay, noted uh, yeah. that I have sort of a sense of them, but um, point being because they're images and they speak to me, it's like, oh, I know what this means astrology or some some tarot cards like some decks um it feels a little bit more opaque and like almost yeah like I, I never actually got this feeling in school but just like of like oh like things to memorize and it feels a bit overwhelming mm -hmm. of like there's yeah. so much to learn and i wonder how you relate to that and how what you advise someone that does want to learn about this stuff like how to absorb the information in a way that like it actually makes sense yeah totally um so you know, as you can probably tell, I'm tend to be a very analytical thinker, uh, very book focused. So I, uh, you know, I really to lots of books behind him. There's lots <laughs> yeah. and lots of books behind him. <laughs> so I really thrive on uh, this sort of research and you know learning and like I, I just devour books. So it works really well for me. But mm -hmm. the other ways that uh, I would recommend are really the ways I'm coming into later too, which is like. Uh, my friend Tao Lamott, for example, would say, just go outside, look at the sky mm -hmm. every morning, see where the moon is, you know, see where the sun is, when the sun rises, think about solar things, uh, especially one thing that's really useful. That's a very easy way to get involved in astrological sort of living is to try and live as well and as conveniently as you can, according to planetary days and hours. So the days of the week are actually all named after planets and gods. Uh, you know, Monday is moon the moon day, literally. Uh, Tuesday is named after Tyr or Mars. Wednesday is Mercury. Uh, Thursday is Thor or <clears throat> Jupiter. Friday is uh, Freya or Venus. And then Saturn is Saturday. And Sun is, of course, uh, or Sat yeah, Saturn, Saturday. And then Sun is, of course, the Sunday. And um, 
you can do, you can just look up some really basic ideas about what these planets signify and just do some stuff like that. You know, on Mondays, you think about the body, you feed, you, uh, you know, reflect on family, on emotions, uh, you know, you, you nurture, you cuddle up, you be cozy. Those are all kind of moon things. Tuesdays, you might work out, you might uh, do something that, you know, feels more aggressive or do something daring uh, to you, or you might think about, you know, yourself as a warrior in some form. Wednesday is learning research, talking to people, communication. Thursday is can be, you know, meditation, contemplation, uh, reading philosophy. It can also be, you know, anything kind of open, opening, expansive that adds something new to your life and to your experience. Uh, Fridays will be like good times, really. Venus, associations, friendships, dates, partying, etc. Saturn uh, is actually a work day a lot of the time because it's Saturn, but it can also sometimes be rest because Saturn Saturn, you know, brings you just down to the ground because Mars can also be very work. But Saturn can sometimes just be like, it's time to do all the dishes or it's time to handle all this, this like tedious stuff that I haven't wanted to deal with all this time. You know, like it's Saturn. That's what Saturn likes to do. And then Sunday is time to reflect on yourself, maybe to go shopping for clothes or to work on your identity or think about your values and who you are or the principles of generosity, any of those things. So those are each day. But then each hour is also broken up and assigned to a given planet as well. And there's a great uh, site for this, it's just planetarydays.net. You can just type that in directly and then it'll take you there and you just plug in your location and the day and then you just get a chart there and you can just look at it all day. And then if you're like, oh, it's Mars hour coming up, this is a great time to do a workout, I'll do that. Or, oh, it's Venus hour, maybe I'll you know reach out to a friend or something like that. It's a very easy way to kind of get started. Um, that, you know, that's in sort of like a practice of like, I'm, I'm doing the right things at the right times. In terms of getting to know them in a more embodied sense, you know, you'll probably find some of that that way, but really you can do meditations on the, the planets themselves. You know, you can conceptualize them, you can go on journeys, you can stare at them and open up your senses and think about and feel or feel within your body what these planets are trying to tell you and what they're trying to say. Um, ideally, you know, while you're looking outside directly at them, but if you can't do that, like a meditation and a visualization works just as well. Very interesting. Yeah, that's helpful. That's an approach I had not heard before. Um, you mentioned that you really like like reading and studying and things like this. And I also know, as you've sort of alluded to, but um, you really like writing as well and sharing what you've learned. And I'm, I would be just curious to hear you describe how you think about writing and sharing what you've learned. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because my goal is essentially to... I would like to change the way in which we relate to time itself and, you know, like just life, because I've learned this thing that has really brought me a ton of calm and equanimity because I understand that actually I'm in the eye of the storm and we all are all the time, constantly. And there's a sort of peace there and being able to, you know, look out and then dodge the rocks that come flying in as you go. Um, but as I was going about that, I began to have lots of conversations with skeptics and things like that, especially because I came up in Twitter around, you know, Teapot, this part of Twitter, uh, which at least when I began was much more kind of like secular, secular agnostic, materialist, rationalist, or post-rationalist, et cetera. But then, you know, I'd occasionally get, you know, post uh, like rationalist and whatnot here and there. And then I realized that I just hated talking to them, honestly, <laughs> like I just didn't care about the work of like individually talking to singular people and having these really long discourses and arguments because I realized that every single person is coming from where I came from. I've already had all of those thoughts and all of those conversations and all of those processes. So for me, it's like, I'm just, you know, reliving things when I'm going through that. And also having to deal with somebody who's usually very upset at me and emotionally rooted in their arguments and refuses to see the points I'm making. And you only have 280 characters to do it. So mm -hmm. it, it's the bad place for me, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized, well, if I do want to change the consciousness of everything and everybody to make life a little bit better, hopefully, then uh, we have to convince a lot of people. 
you know, and we especially have to convince people who are smart, who are influential, who uh, are willing and open to be convinced and at least like see the data, right? Like that are in the same position that I was where I was like, ah, maybe I don't really want to do this, but I'll do it because I'm, I'm, very, I'm still desperately curious because there's uh, a lot of utility here um, or something that could really change my life. I'll, I'll put up with it. So essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to scale my experience. I'm trying to scale uh, what I personally went through. And I view it as kind of like building a bunch of bridges across an archipelago that eventually connects to a massive landmass, which is like all of woo and spirituality. But, you know, everything leading up there is like tour guides and signposts and, you know, stay away from cougar signs and things like that, that tell you like, this is a good way to build a epistemic framework around this or how to conceptualize it in a way that doesn't take away too much of your uh, personal um, sense of choice, right? The sense of free will, but also acknowledges the fact that the mainstream conception of how reality is, there's plenty of demonstrable evidence you can go find that shows it not to be necessarily as true as we usually think. Um, so the writing essentially covers that along many paths. Like for me, I don't really write for skeptics. I write for people who are, you know, on the cusp, who are looking over the edge, who are very curious about it. And so that's why I, some of my first writing was, you know, my guide to natal astrology, because I believe like, why do we, we don't need to have a conversation about this. And I don't have a time, have the time for it. Cause I have both a full-time job in astrology practice and research. And I have all these, you know, big aspirations and goals and stuff. So like, I can't be getting into the replies with just randos to talk about why I believe, believe in astrology, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote the guide because my goal is like, Hey, let's not like, why waste time discoursing? Just try it. Just do it on your own chart. I'm going to teach you the very basics of what I wish I had when I first learned and just go for it. Um, and that's worked pretty well so far. Like I've had a few people message me and be like, yeah, it's really good, you know, seeing uh, explorations, blah, blah. But it's also, you know, a kind of very private process. So I expect that to bubble up later. And, you know, I have been seeing that through Twitter, which has been very gratifying. Um, the other piece too was the phenomenology or around here we take our phenomenology seriously essay because it really is the foundation both for astrology, uh, tarot, for really any sort of practice. And it is especially important when it comes to the idea of like entity contact because that's something I'm going to be getting into. Uh, and I need to give people a framework for how to think about what I'm describing because I'm the person that's coming over here and being like, hey, I talked to a God who gave me a book and it helped me solve a problem. Uh, and so, you know, I got to have like so something around that because otherwise people will just dismiss me, um, which, you know, if they want to do that, that's also totally fine. Uh, because ultimately my goal is to write out for myself and build bridges everywhere and people start crossing the bridges from the different perspectives they have. So like the, the last piece of writing I will probably be doing uh, for a while is a piece on uh, astro, a astro uh, fact for astro curious skeptics, essentially. And it'll be an actual walkthrough of all the major arguments that I hear, uh, the typical discussion points that I have. And then, you know, also putting in a way where like, I, I'm not really trying to convince people a ton. I just want to give people the stuff that I've seen and have them take a look at it. And that's often why the writing is very personally focused. I'm like, this is about you and your individuality. You know, this is about you and your perspective of the world, because really that's like the nature of how all this stuff works, in my opinion. Um, so that's one piece that I'm uh, simultaneously excited and dreading because, you know, that kind of like opens up the, the gateway to that sort of discourse. Um, but it's an inevitability. Like if we want to change the world, then we have to deal with the people that disagree with us and the, the things that we want to do. Um, and the people that can change the world, like, you know, I'm just one person, uh, the people that can truly change the world have connections, have resources, have all this stuff that I don't have. And so I'm trying to build a framework for those of them who are curious and open and are willing to su suspend their disbelief. Um, the writing I'm working on right now is also a piece on entity contact and kind of goes through all the major stories that I've experienced as well as a whole metaphysical, epistemic, conceptual framework for it. But then it kind of leads into like, you know, but if you really want to get something out of this, you have to take it seriously, at least in the moment. And so well, let's just talk about it like that. Um, and then people can take it or leave it. Do you have any ambitions outside of your writing, like things that you'd like to work on? I know, I know, I, I think I remember you alluding to like different software programs you'd like to create or things like that. Like what, what other kinds of goals, if any, do you have? 
Yeah. Um, so for instance, on the topic of elections, one thing I would love to make is just an automatic election calculator. That's an app on your phone. And the way it works is it just gives you a bunch of times during the day that are the best to do any given thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to think about it. You, you can look and get all the information if you want to, and it's right there, but just for the average person, you can just look at this thing and be like, oh, I should go do this activity right now. It's suggested or like, oh, this is a great day for a date. I should set something up for then. Or, oh, you know, this is a great time to go grocery shopping or to a restaurant or whatever. Like there's so many tiny ways in which our lives can be improved by astrological timing, which can be assisted by computation. Mm -hmm. You know, millennia ago, that would never be a question. It would be like, you know, super important life or death, the family matters, money impacting questions because an astrologer had to literally like draw a circle, do the lines of a consultant ephemeris, put all the planets there, but now we can click a button, you know, mm -hmm. like it's crazy. We have this incredible, incredible tool that's available to us. Um, so that's on the very basic level. On broader levels, I think it would be very interesting to build software that allows people to build charting software that allows people to input their experiences as data and then cross-reference that across all of the same transits and signif uh, signifiers that occur across the entire database, anonymized it, you know, consent opt-in required. So like you'd have to say, yes, you can include this in the whatever. Um, but then once that's there, you can like literally scan a list of people's personal experiences with a given transit. Hmm. This kind of does exist a little bit in an app called The Pattern, but they kind of obscure the aspect from you. Like, they don't tell you it's astrology. They're like, oh, it's magical timing. And hmm. you're like, it's, it's astrology. Like, very clearly, that's how it's working. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's one of the, the better astrology apps I've seen. Very interesting. It lets people discuss it um, because they'll talk about uh, natal transits, I believe, and also mundane transits as just like an aggregated sort of comment board. That's really cool. Um, but more broadly speaking, I have lots of other ideas in terms of like astrology as an industrial reality mapping tool. You know, mm -hmm. like there are every single business, every single country, every single world leader, CEO, you know, location, whatever building has a natal chart. And you can also predict based on it. You can forecast, you can do all that kind of stuff. And one of the, you know, there are lots of astrologers making all kinds of predictions about, you know, recent wars and conflicts and things like that. Um, but the thing about it is you have to spot it coming. You have to know which chart is relevant, right? So you can only fit so many in your head as a human astrologer, but with if you have a massive database and you can visualize the connections between those charts and how it ties into the transits, you can build a map of reality without like even looking at anything. Like, Ideally, you can tie it to the news too. You could use semantic analysis. You could use machine learning on the news. You could categorize topics automatically by you know what planet they're most likely associated with. Um, there's an actual direct example of this that also exists, just not in the manner I'm I'm explaining or envisioning, where it's in the app called Mastro Gold. They call it an astrology expert system, where they took every single classic description of all the transits and uh, midpoints and a bunch of other techniques that they used and. And um, basically correlated them uh, or turned it into this matrix, like statistical matrix that you can access at any point in time by looking at the transits, pulling out the associated uh, signifiers and words, and then you can build as like peaks on a, on a graph where those periods of time are most likely to be the most impactful. The example they give is Julia Roberts, uh, or I forget who it is exactly, but... Um, I'll say Julia Roberts, but it might be somebody else, uh, lost her husband and her brother within like three days to cancer. And the application shows mourning as the highest peak in her entire life within like four days of that point. <laughs> and that's something that already exists, you know, like that was done, that happened. Um, and at the same time, that's also something we need to reckon with because it's only a matter of time before the software exists. And I have a feeling that it already does exist and is used by massive companies, especially financial companies. They all know about astrology for sure, at least the smart ones. Um, there's tons of astrological traders, you know, kings, royalty, celebrities, all of them have personal astrologers if they, you know, have gotten a glimpse of it. Ronald Reagan had their, his own personal astrology, <laughs> astrologer. Um, that's a very famous example. Uh, like, it's everywhere and it's already being used just in a very occulted way. So there's lots of possibilities of what we can apply this computation to, but it's also 
one of the significant upcoming struggles and challenges that I think will be a honestly a defining moment of the next 200 years we're entering into, which is the Age of Air. During the last Age of Air, uh, we went through an inquisition and a plague, which reset feudalism and raised the value of individual workers. And pretty much was a really hard time, but it also resulted in like loads of spiritual experience and lots of research and exploration, but at the same time, lots of judgment and, you know, uh, authoritative crackdowns and lockdowns on those practices too. We also have Neptune recently or soon going into Aries in about 2025 and Neptune and Aries will probably signify the, the rise of the cult leader because that's what Aries is all about. It's like individual figures, leaders, visionaries, and Neptune is all about, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll, spirituality, mysticism, uh, the unseen, all that kind of stuff. So like there's, you know, I do feel that we're on the cusp of a moment that regardless of what I do, these things will come to be and will come to exist. So my goal is to see if I can build it the right way in a way that is respectful of human agency, that is respectful and not extractive, that lets us live our lives better. And, you know, that is really a, a fight for the consciousness of the entire world, like in no small way. Uh, it is saying, hey, we don't need to have this insane capitalistic machine that devours everybody because we don't see an end in sight and because we think we've already fucked up the planet, you know, like there is a spiritual learning evolutionary process here that we can opt into. And the better we do it, the better it gets for everybody. And there's plenty to go around. Uh, you know, I'm a very abundance thinker, but it's also has to be done in a way that's very strategic and tactical because, you know, so many people go about this and they're like, oh, I found the secret, I found the secret. Hey everybody, I found the secret. And then people are like, you're crazy or you're a moron or you're whatever um, because they're not uh, prestiged enough, not professional enough or not uh, distanced or balanced or whatever enough. So that's, that's a big part of how I go about this in, in terms of my presentation and my background, which is that, you know, people, uh, I've had people tell me like, yeah, like I went and saw you for the first time to get into any of this because I knew you were a programmer. I mm -hmm. knew you'd probably be able to speak my language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm hearing you right, it seems like there's sort of two components that you're aiming to create, like one uh, well-reasoned, well-articulated, clear, written, corpus that makes sense to people that are open-minded but not uh necessarily already knowledgeable about these things and then also that you want there to be sort of computational infrastructure for using these tools and methods at scale is is, is am i hearing that correctly yeah absolutely what is the future that you envision being possible if those two components are in place <sighs> honestly that's a really hard question because it's almost assuming, you know, it works and it's like widespread and people are like, oh yeah, astrology, cool. Um, <clears throat> definitely not going to be that easy, but I, I kind of can't even imagine what a world would be like that lived that way. You know, mm. like, I think there are some cultures that probably know a little bit more about that. Like apparently Bali is still very a magical sort of place. Like it's very common to have astrologers there. It's very common to, you know, like have magical consultancies, things like that. Um, I would expect to generally a wider, like I would say the most important thing to start with even before astrology is connecting with the body. Hmm. And that is kind of what I've used astrology to get to because I'm a very brain thinky sort of person by default. And using the astrology got me to my own body. It got me and all this other stuff made me realize like, oh, like I actually feel things I'm in the tempo because once you're embodied and once you're feeling your emotions, you realize why you do things. You know, you realize that there's something weird going on inside you and that you have all these conflicts and these tensions that are driving you and causing you to act out in these ways while outside you're being valorized for being crazy basically and, you know, suffering and going after these things that are driven by uh, a sort of core wound or loss. Like that, that is what drives so many, so many people. Um, and it's not until you can learn about that, integrate it, transcend it, you know, bring the good, the bad, all of it with you to a higher level that you can really like utilize it. So I hope that the tempo would be slower. I hope there would be an emphasis on, you know, what we call vibe, more. 
Uh, I hope there would be a much bigger emphasis on containers, like, you know, the ritual process. Uh, one of my <laughs> more obscure hot takes is that the reason modern meetings are so bad is because nobody knows how to do rituals or containers anymore. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, yeah. Like, I hate meetings. And then if yeah. you add structure, they go so much better and they're yeah. not awful. Yeah. And to like understand what you're there for and like even who's in charge, you know, just as a, as a uh, matter of course, you know, like you, you are the person that is in charge of this meeting, not as a means of authority, but as we agree to submit to you. So this can happen, you know, yeah. so we can get through this freaking uh, drudgery of an experience together and, you know, make it better. Because like, I also think that the level of joy should increase broadly as well. Like, I mean, thinking about work, like I, everybody I talk to is kind of like, suppressing themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. um, some workplaces are different, but you know, especially in tech and especially uh, anywhere that's like very brainy, it tends to very much be that way. I like to think that we would have better initiations too. Like that's another thing that's been lost, which is the idea of when you're supposed to encounter a certain idea, uh, the general level of respect for these sorts of arts and practices, uh, a general sense of resplendence of like an intricate or inherent worthiness, I suppose. And I don't wanna say deservingness because those sound kind of different in my head, but that like whatever you're going through and whatever you're experiencing, you have a place where you are and everybody around you could see you and could help you through that experience at the same time. I don't know. Those are just some notes. Those are those are my <laughs> utopian thoughts. Uh huh. I love them. Uh, we've covered quite a bit of territory. I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to mention or talk about or have a conversation about. Yeah. Um, the big thing for me lately has been the idea of omens, actually. I think that'd be a fun thing to talk about because mm. we're actually surrounded by omens all the time. And the way I describe an omen is anything unusual that seems to happen like to you, you know, you didn't initiate it. Um, it something that pulls your attention that makes you think like, oh, that was kind of significant. Something interesting just happened there because you can actually use astrology to analyze an omen and even find the meaning. You can mm -hmm. find whether it was a good omen, a neutral omen, just affirming or, or whatever. Um, and that's been a very interesting thing because it's the element of like signs that show up repeatedly throughout your life. Um, and just as a general discussion topic, you know, I'm kind of curious if, if you've uh, as you've been thinking about astrology and, you know, I know you can live in a, in a magical worldview for the most part as well. Uh, how have you been having any, have you been having uh, experiences where you're like, huh, I wonder what that was about. Hmm. Well, it's funny. The first thing that came to mind is I, I'm at my parents' house and uh, earlier today, there's a, there's a porch room. That's like an outdoor indoor porch thing. And um, it has a sliding glass doors and, my mother accidentally locked me in the room earlier today oh. for like an hour or two. And I was like, oh, man, uh, th th that, that felt like something that like happened to me. I was like, you know, sort of arbitrary uh, in the moment. But now I'm like, oh, what was that about? Um, um, I think, let's see. Well, more broadly, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not quite sure if it fits under the category that you're talking about, but there's I alluded at the beginning of this conversation to this essay that I'm writing, and I don't know if it's going to see the light of day, partly because it's it's very, for me, relatively woo, but more so because it's extremely personal. I'm like having to write about memoir of really, really some of the most painful periods of my life so far, mm -hmm. so far, yeah. <laughs> so far. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I think... Uh, Yes. So, and, and, and also there's like ethical questions there of like what, what can be written about and like, if especially if it involves other people and that sort of thing, I mm -hmm. take ethics of speech very seriously. So I'm postponing deciding what I will do with the essay until I've written it. But um, um, the, the, the sort of, yeah, magical sense of it is um, last year I read this book, Weaving Fate by Aidan Wachter. Have, have you mm. ever heard of him? 
I, read yeah, them. yeah. I have all of his books and I've read none of them. They're great, oh. apparently. <laughs> yeah, Weaving Fate, in, in particular, I haven't read his newest one, but Weaving Fate, I liked quite a bit. Six Ways is, it, Six Ways is kind of like, um, I like, do you know Shinzen Young? Uh, I don't think so. He, I'm actually named after him and he's the reason I started meditating, but he, he has a very like, uh, almost like you're writing as well, just like very methodical approach to things. And so Six, six Ways is kind of like, a very good intro magic text but i also found it very like dry and like not uh as helpful for me personally but weaving fate is like a hell of a read and it's basically like time is very strange and here are some experiments you can run on time and reading that book i realized that looking back um there's a handful of events that i've picked out in my life that had i'd say almost like a specific flavor to them which i'm still working on describing hence writing mm -hmm. this essay but like how I currently understand it, maybe I will revise this, but how I currently understand it is uh, those were moments in which I was trying to contact my past self and that I did not know that that was possible. And so it was sort of like a hazy radio signal of like, mm -hmm. what is going on? Like, what, why am I getting this really weird sense about this situation or something? And then um, now that, at least in my current worldview, that communication across time is possible, like I can, um, you know, like, for example, reach out to the future and be like, okay, what should I do about this current situation? And then get like a pretty clear answer, like, you should do this or like, yeah. whatever, like, oh, okay, like, here we go. Um, and it's, there's not, it's not like garbled in the same way that the first times that these happened, I mean, I was a kid and I was just like, like, um, or like a teenager and I'd be like, what is going on? Like, um, um, and so those, were much more confusing to me. I didn't understand what was happening, but now I'm like, oh, like I was trying to be like, no, don't do the thing, uh, whatever. So um, I don't know. I, I I don't know if those would categorize as omens, but that's something I've been thinking quite a bit about of like time being very strange and and really us having some kind of causal impact over it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting because they've also found you know, science, scientists have found that there are like ways you can reproduce retrocausality in the lab as well. Um, I forget what it was precisely, but it basically points to the idea of sending information backwards in time. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's this idea that from the original emanation that all of this is just reflecting a sort of divine order or divine mind or thought, right? And so, that thought is very kind of wibbly wobbly timey wimey to put it uh, Doctor Who st style, and I I find that really interesting because it's it's like is it you from the timeline where that worked or the timeline where it didn't work out you know mm -hmm. or do we simultaneously actually exist in all timelines like I, I know people who genuinely believe that and when they they will talk about changing timelines by which they really mean simply changing their own subjective state and perspective in order to orient them themselves through the various timelines that exist but they also put it in a way where they say uh that or I'm trying to describe something I don't understand completely well, which is why I'm struggling, uh, is they're trying to, they have an almost embodied sense within themselves of when they're doing these changes and moving through certain types of timelines. Like they describe it as having an embodied sense of the, the fabric of space and time itself and being able to sense motion or alternations or when things are different throughout that. Um, as a general, you know, suspension of disbeliever, I'm prone to buy it. And I also have friends who can like, just tell you with their bodies where planets are in the sky. Like it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Or like, mm -hmm. I have recently begun to do a thing where like, I'll begin meditating at exactly, you know, a certain transit is happening. And then I'll look and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's when I felt the impulse to meditate like really strongly. And then there was the planet associated with it just right there. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> it's very like, I would say like, this makes me think that, you know, of, of another kind of core axiom for me, which is that information is absolutely everywhere. And not only can you read it, but you can also provoke it. Mm -hmm. You can 
do things to to elicit more information. Like there's also an example given of an astrologer, classic uh, famous horary astrologer, William Lilly, who did a reading about for himself of who stole my fish because <laughs> somebody had stolen his fish from him. And the answer was that he wasn't going to get it back. It was like, it was gone, you know, the thief took it. And he was like, no, screw that. Now that I know what the thief is like, what they look like, where they likely live, all kinds of stuff like that, which he could read from the horary chart, I'm going to go find that guy. I'm going to get my fucking fish back. And so he did. He found the guy. It was half eaten, hence why, you know, he couldn't really get it, get it back. Uh, but he literally was able to interdict into his own reading and the advice that would normally be given, you know, and that is kind of also our role. We have a, uh, at least in this metaphysical, metaphysical conception, we have a very special role as human beings as kind of being the connectors and intermediar intermediaries of this sort of dream reality that we live in. The bad way to take it is solipsistically where we say, oh, well, you know, we can kill all the animals and enslave them because they don't have qualia and it doesn't matter. It's just us. Uh, or even if they do suffer, who cares because they don't matter. Uh, and that, you know, all these entities are in an oppositional relationship to us. Like that's, you know, a poor way to do it. And that's kind of the way that I think a lot of, you'll see a lot of uh, dark people in dark places will turn their spirituality that way. Um, but we can do it in such a way where we're, you know, conscious, uh, custodians of our experience and of the things and the connections that live in our lives. And that applies to ourselves too. Like there's such a huge story of self-love and self-care and really looking out for your own best interests here if you wanna dig really deep for that. Um, yeah. What did the advice feel like? Did like as now that you're here in the the present moment, or more, you know, realizing that you can get this information from your uh, future? I'm kind of curious. Like, is is there a specific emphasis, or are you surprised by anything that comes through? Hmm. Now, now that I'm aware of this sort of thing, um, yeah, I think I'm. I'd say there's sort of two kinds of genres of experience with this sort of thing. One is where I'm actively soliciting information and one is where it feels like information is coming through. And I think there's probably still a little bit of work for me to do to be like, ah, yes, like noticing that something is coming through, but, but, but knowing that that's possible, I think makes me sort of more prone to it. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, when I am actively soliciting information, well, first off, I find it really helpful to be relaxed in my body and then be uh, like lying down specifically. I like to lie down and then mm -hmm. and then to enter bliss states or jhanas first because it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, Actually, yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, jhana two, uh, like that's as far as I've gotten. But like, what that space is really great for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes, yeah. And, and I mean, well, and, and of course, I, I always, whenever I talk about this, I'm like, oh, I know uh, some teachers would be like, oh, you're not entering jhana. Some would be like, you are. But for me, like the thing that I am referring to, I, I go to those states and it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, um, yeah, and then, and then when, and then it's like, okay, now that I've been there, I want to, um, well, there's a few ways of doing it, but one is it could be sort of visual of like, I'm specifically imagining certain things that I would like to come about, mm -hmm. or um, or I could ask a question. And then often if I go into that mode, it feels very verbal. Like I, I'm also a very verbal person. And so it's like, I don't get so much, uh, I don't know, like somatic senses or like, um, I don't know, it's just, but it's just like, it, it almost feels like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm experiencing it's like, okay, I'm going to try to contact my future self. And so what would he say to me? And then it's like, well, it's still me just in a different time and probably like wiser and kinder and more skilled and that sort of thing. But it's like, then, uh, so it sounds very much like me, but just like, it, it almost feels like a reaching. It's like, okay, like you ever see those like pneumatic tubes that carry messages? I was thinking mm -hmm. about this. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's like a message coming down. Like, let me reach in the tube. And, yeah. Um, and then it's from me. So it's like same same sort of like conceptual mode or vibe, but then it's like kinder and gentler. He seems very relaxed and like at ease. I don't know, still a little tension going on, stress with this guy, but he's, you know? And, yeah, uh, yeah. And then it's like, you know, various advice about whatever it is that I'm asking about. And um, 
it's usually tracks and is like helpful and like firm but kind very very sweet and um yeah i mean sometimes there's things that i don't want to hear i think this is a theme with you know what i was telling you about the fear of like oh is there something i don't want to hear and like will i resist it mm -hmm. but but the, he is usually able to put it to me in a way of that's like um okay i know you don't want to hear this i know this isn't what you'd want but it's what is and also like here's how we're going to work with it in a way that's good and like you're still learning something or like making it not not worse than it needs to be or something like that and like framing it in a way that's still like helpful or proactive or um like making the best of a situation even if it's not what i'd prefer or choose or something like that and um and then you know of course there's the same attitude going back of like it, it's really easy to like i mean yeah it <laughs> like you know move move starting to be moved to tears thinking about it but when i think about my past self like things that i've gone through and like how i would talk to myself in the past about that it's like i have nothing but endless sweetness and care for my past self that went through various difficult experiences and uh, things i would love to tell him of like okay this is really hard now but you're going to gain this skill through this or see this insight or like mm -hmm. this will pass and like this is not going to last forever or whatever it is in a specific situation very different but advice that i'd give my past self but like it's the same sort of attitude but like in reverse and you know the really interesting thing i'll add as well is there's a sense when i reach out in particular i know I, I love time travel to movies so much. It's like, yeah. it feels like a time travel movie in that like, if I'm going to intentionally reach out to the future, then I have to sort of make a promise to myself. And I think this ethics comes through here. I have to make a promise. Like I am going to reach back and deliver the message that I'm about to receive. Mm, and so like in that moment, I'm cool. receiving it, but like yeah. I have to like follow through at some point in order for yeah. to receive it. You know? That's really cool. And yeah, and that's such a good point. It's like, you know, the commitment to yourself, right? Uh, I really love that. Like, I can totally imagine you, Tashin, as that wiser, calmer, more grounded person who's like, you know, ready to communicate in a way that, you know, something you don't necessarily want to hear, but is delivered with love and in a way that's tuned towards you. So uh, I really, really like that. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, it's been important knowing that it's a promise, just I'll add as well to like, I, I the, again, I've remember these like, I don't know how many there are, but five or six moments that feel really critical that were like, what the hell was going on there when it when I experienced it. It's like I've had to go back and deliver the promise of like, here's what I was trying to tell you and it didn't come through clearly, but like, mm. um, I, I've had to send those messages and those are all moments that I would absolutely would want to have, have said something like, gotcha. please, uh, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So is it like the kind of thing where when you were younger, did you feel like you were being reached out to by yourself in maybe a more like raw sort of way? And you were like, oh, I need to give myself some wisdom. Or were you like, oh, dang, I went through all these experiences and this is what I want to tell myself past, uh, past self now, now that I've lived through it. And like just as kind of a general practice. Definitely that now. Um, and I want to do that as much as I can. It feels, you know, there's this principle of like psychic equivalence. Uh, do you know what that is? No. It's like on some level. So, so if you just sort of like bracket the, the, the ontological truth of any of this, like for the, the principle of psychic equivalence says like, if you are imagining something visually in your mind, if you're experiencing it somatically, then your lowest levels of your brain don't really understand mm, the difference mm -hmm. between like reality and not reality. And so it can have like healing effects for you, even if mm -hmm. um, it's not like quote real. So I don't know, I, I, I then you can sort of enter what is the reality of it. And I, I find it useful to like take this stuff seriously internally in my own phenomenology. Like just like these were really weird experiences that I had in the past that like make much more sense explanatorily with a certain worldview, but e even the setting that aside, it's like very healing to go back and like remember these experiences and then say kind thing. I mean, it's a meta practice basically, mm -hmm. but involving time, like yeah. say yeah. sweet things to yourself. But um, experientially when they happened, there were, I think, and maybe this is even the flavor is just like a sense of confusion. Like what is happening right here? Like um, a simple example, it's a bit vulnerable, but not that vulnerable. I don't know. It's like, the first time with my first girlfriend, like, uh, you know, we were becoming sexually active and it's like, oh, do we want to have sex or not? And like, 
in theory, I was like, yeah, great. Like that seems good. And I didn't have any like moral framework that that was like a bad thing to do, or like there, I didn't have any like shame about it. And yet every time we would start to, it'd be like, oh, like, I don't, I don't, I would get the sense of like, I don't know, like, no. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, where is this coming from? It, it almost felt like, um, it, it even really felt like, I think about this a lot with like, if you're reading a story, right? Like I wrote about this recently, but if you're reading a story, right? And, and, and you know, like, oh, character, don't do that thing. Like, don't do the thing. You want to yeah. like scream at the book, like, don't do it, you know? And it felt like that, except I was the character in the story. Like, and it was like, where is this coming from? Like, I don't have any, I'm not like some um, closeted religious person that feels terrible yeah, about like, being narrator. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that was something I had to, and then I had to basically override that. I, I actually got high to have sex the first time because it was like I had to like repress that basically. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, you could explain that elsewhere. But to me now, it's like, I think, yeah, I think I would go back and be like, don't do not do it. You don't have to do this now. You could do this with someone else um, for various reasons. And then, of course, ended up deciding to do it anyway. But like, yeah, you have to go back and send those messages and um yeah it's, it's like not something I ever expected but like when I've looked for this flavor in my own experience it's like loud and clear five six experiences like this where it's like mm -hmm. and 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 again before I learned about this there's this very clear signal of of conf I'm sorry like noisy signal of confusion like um like having a thought that I don't usually have or a feeling that I don't usually have mm -hmm. or being in this extreme circumstance and like some like almost like external like what is, I don't know what's happening. Um, uh, I don't know. I, another time I met someone, the very first time I saw them, I had an extremely mean thought about them. And I do not mm. normally have extremely mean thoughts about people. That's not, I don't know, sometimes a little judgmental or like irritable or something, but, but like extremely mean thought. No, that's not, yeah. that's normal, for, not normal for this guy. And it was just like conspicuous. It was like, why am I having such a reaction to this person? Yeah. And I think, again, because I didn't understand it, it was like, that was the way that it translated to the phenomenology at that time of, of the person that didn't know about this sort of experience. Whereas mm -hmm. now I might be able to be like, oh, like I'm getting a really weird feeling about this person. Like maybe it would be better not to associate with them or something like that. Um, okay, you know, <laughs> like that's a, that's a, that, would, that would come through both more clearly to me, but also probably in a kinder way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's, an interesting kind of like recursive fractal element to it that really gets messy where it's like perhaps that initial experience of having that resistance was really important later in order to understand and contextualize the experiences you had later but then you had to make the promise in the first place to go back and tell yourself <laughs> totally, about it totally. so yeah <laughs> your life becomes every weird harebrained uh sci-fi movie you've ever watched where you're like what like yeah, yeah yeah and i guess the trick is that you know it it it's the flat circle thing right where you think it's like that but it's like that uh -huh, it's just uh -huh. squashed um all on top of each other i mean i don't know uh, i read some i read the order of time by uh carlo Rivelli, which mm -hmm. is really really great for getting uh time unpilled i guess mm -hmm. where you're just like oh right none of this is real sort of like i can't actually experience any time beyond what i'm literally observing right around me uh, that's basically the takeaway mm -hmm. um and in fact, to, to see everything, to know everything would be to experience no time at all because the passage of time is actually just the relative, uh, it has something to do with like gravity and space time continuum and the relativity between you and the other point. If you're, if you don't have distance from that point, if you can't see things, then, uh, or if you, if you can see everything and you don't have distance from those points, everything appears frozen. Uh, I can't explain it in a good way, but the book is great. I highly recommend it. Um, and that frozenness is also like literally kind of like having the mind of God, right? Because that is being the undifferentiated, being everything, being uh, formless by the fact that you are all forms in a way. Because in the Gnostic sort of concept, uh, that's what the emanations are for. It's to create difference, to create experience. You need all these different sorts of things that are happening. Um, that's a little bit of a tangent rabbit hole, but um, that's to say that, yeah, it gets really, really freaking weird. And the more I learn about it, the more I'm just like, 
oh, it, it's all kind of fake and it's all kind of a dream. But like, uh -huh. we still have the system here that can help us keep track of like the mundane reality, but you can totally step outside time. You can get help at any time. That's, that's really been one of the healing things through this process, which is to realize that I have help. You know, we all have help. We have ourselves even. Uh, and then we have more than ourselves too. If, if we ourselves, you know, maybe we don't trust ourselves at some point in life. Uh, I think that's really beautiful. Mm. Well, I have to say it's it's really lovely to talk to someone uh, for whom this is, you know, the world that you inhabit because it's, it, I don't always feel comfortable talking about this stuff, but it, but again, it's like, yeah, if you take your phenomenology seriously, like it will go to weird places mm -hmm. like that, you know, you did not expect that other people may not know, but, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, I, for example, the easiest example is like, I remember I used to think just like received notion energy is bullshit. Like people are talking about energy. Like that's a non-existent thing that they're using to lie to you. It's not real. And then I started feeling it in my body and I feel energy in my body every day now. It's like, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't, deny this, you know, yeah. like, can't I just unring that bell. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, you know, it's like, right yeah, it's, it's happening right now. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's like all the time. And yeah. similarly, like, you know, oh, I actually, you know, I remember one of the first things that happened with this is for, there was a period in high school where I just like had a bunch of precognitive dreams all of the mm. time and they were banal. They were so banal. They were not meaningful or like at no detectable thing, but it was like, oh, I know I'm going to see this person in this room that I don't usually go to the next day. And like, lo and behold, oh. like saw that person the next day. And it happened, I don't know, 20 times over a course of a year, banal, oh. but consistent. It's like, I didn't even have any, I didn't know anyone that ever talked about anything like that at the time. But it was like, okay, I guess I can tell the future by like a day sometimes. Like, yeah. Okay, like time seems pretty is, useless, but yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> but like, but it's true. It's like yeah, it totally. is my phenomenology. So, um, you know, anyway, it's it's nice to talk to someone who takes their phenomenology seriously, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Tashin. Uh, you know, I think we kind of went along similar lines of being like, oh yeah, like you know, here's somebody I can actually talk to about all this stuff and go really deep. So I'm always really grateful when we get to connect and chat. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you on, friend. Thanks for sharing everything that you did. Yeah, absolutely. Mm.